This episode is brought to you by Michelob Ultra, the official beer sponsor of the NBA, who's getting you closer to the game than ever with exclusive prizes. Enter for your chance to win at MichelobUltra.com slash courtside. Enjoy responsibly. 2024 Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. Michelob Ultra registered courtside sweepstakes. No purchase necessary. Open to U.S. residents 21 and up. Begins October 19th, 2023 and ends June 12th, 2024. Multiple entry periods. See official rules at MichelobUltra.com slash rules for free entry, entry deadlines, prices, and details. Message and data rates may apply. Void where prohibited. Jewelry isn't a gift you give just once. It's a way to remind your loved one of a beautiful moment every time they see it. Blue Nile can help you find the gift that says how you feel and says it beautifully with expert guidance and a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Go to BlueNile.com and experience the convenience of shopping Blue Nile, the original online jeweler since 1999. That's BlueNile.com to find the perfect jewelry gift for any occasion. BlueNile.com. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. The kick ahead, and Dusty's chasing it. The bounce sits up. The Dragons are steamrolling to week two of the finals. Inside the last ten seconds of the game, St George Illawarra to the death, trying. Brown goes to the air, going back is Mabel, oh, leaping high and taking it. Marvellous fashion with Rod Wishart. He has scored an incredible drive that ties this small game up. Bartram from 18 metres out. He strikes it nicely. St George Illawarra win for the first time in their Premiership line. Here's Nathan Blacklock down the sideline. Chippy go with the top of John Kane. Got a room service bounce to win the game for the Dragons. And book himself. Well, good evening, folks, and welcome to a blockbuster episode of the Red V Podcast. It's Tuesday evening once again, and Jack Clifton and Curtis Woodward ready to guide you through everything about the mighty St. George Illawarra Dragons. Well, it is another big episode. It's the first podcast episode of the year talking about some football that's been played by the St. George Illawarra Dragons. We're going to have a, a full review of that performance against South. The Dragons going down by 28 points to six, but I think there was more positives uh, than negatives in that performance on Saturday night at Cogra Oak. We'll also look forward to the side that has been named by Shane Flanagan for uh, week two of the preseason challenge. The Dragons heading out to Western New South Wales to take on the West Tigers at Mudgee. We'll also preview uh, that affair and, of course, uh, wrap up all the latest news. We're going to be talking about Luciana Leilua, Ben Hunt, surprise, surprise, and also Shane Flanagan gives us a bit of an update on... Uh, some of the performances and uh, who he gave a, a tick and a cross to uh, for the Dragons performance uh, on the weekend. Alongside that, a bit of Dragons history. As I mentioned, uh, yeah, reviewing the uh, the defeat against South and also previewing that match against the Tigers this weekend. We'll continue our position preview. We're doing a couple of positions this week. We're going to focus on the front rows, the props and the hooker. It's their turn to, uh, to be analysed this week on the Red V podcast. And of course, we'll take a look at your fans' corner question uh, to finish off the podcast for another week. Well, fresh off uh, making a lovely trip out to beautiful Cogra Oval to uh, have a couple of cold ones on the hill, Kurt Woodward. Uh, it was great to, to catch up on the weekend, Kurt, and have a chance to watch a bit of Dragons footy. And for us to catch up, mate, it's probably been a while in between drinks, quite literally for you and I, probably since the old commentary days. We've certainly spoken a lot on the, on the podcast in recent years, but it was great to catch up in person, mate. And uh, yes, yeah, see uh, a pretty uh, pretty decent evening of football, including a, a couple of trial matches out there at Cogra Oval. How are you travelling tonight, mate? Yeah, good mate. Good back to good to be back on the podcast, and uh, it was great to be out there on Saturday night. Uh, like I mentioned, I, I got in a little bit late, but I had enough time to sneak into the Carlton and have a couple of skewies and hit the Bricky's laptops, <laughs> and I took the old walk down and and brought back the memories of being a kid. Like I said off air, um, you know, Poppy and and Uncle Paul in that um, back up of the northern end they, with their esky looking through the fence instead of um, <laughs> coming in the tight asses, and then at the southern end um, on his 
what was it, uh, 1998 against the Roosters and one of the few games where I said, I'm going to go slide down the hill yeah. and uh, <laughs> run into the fence. Um, that's been uh, good fun, mate. And it was good to catch up with uh, Timmy Bouchard in, in, in person, um, who does a lot of good things to this podcast. And, of course, your mate Josh and, and his um, his father as well, who was a uh, a good fella, unfortunately a Parramatta fan. <laughs> um, but, no, no it, it's a great ground. I haven't been there in a long time. It, it's beautiful. It's carpet. The, the ground's carpet. The hill's carpet. Um, it's easy to get around it and good spirits as well. So good fun and um, just be happy. I'm happy just to be back on the podcast and, and talking the dragons. And it, look, it is. It's a positive podcast tonight. I don't mm. care what anyone says. That was a good 40 minutes of football. Like we agreed on, on um, Saturday night, it's hard to kind of gauge when you're watching the game. But watching it back again today, lots of positives to come out of that, that match. Yes, yeah, certainly was. Uh, good crowd at, at Cogra as well. I, I didn't get the uh, the official crowd attendance, but I reckon it would have put it between eight or 9,000. Yeah, obviously a few Parramatta and Canberra fans and, and South always have fans that travel and, and plenty of red and white as well. But yeah, it wasn't uh, wasn't all uh, wasn't all drama and doom uh, there at, uh, at Cogra Oval on Saturday night. Well, let's uh, jump into your Dragons news and updates for this week, folks. Plenty to get through, so let's jump straight into it here on episode 214 of the Red V Podcast. Well, first things first, let's take a look at the team list that has been named uh, by Shane Flanagan as the Dragons uh, look to battle the West Tigers out at Mudgee on uh, Saturday night, the second preseason or second final preseason game for the Dragons. Uh, Flanagan's announced a 26-man squad. Uh, the only real changes are that Raymond Fatala Mariner, their off-season signing from the Bulldogs, he's come on to the extended interchange. Um, and uh, yeah, that. And we also see Dan Russell coming in uh, with Dylan Egan, Sevilla Tamale, Alec Tuatavake and Jonah Glover dropping out of the squad. It was a 29-man squad, I believe, or 28-man squad uh, last week um, in that, that game against South Sydney, whereas this week it's only a 26-man squad, so obviously a couple of players had to drop off there. A um, little bit surprised that, yeah, to see Dylan Egan drop off. I, I guess there'd been plenty of talk in the last couple of weeks that maybe he would break into the 17, but that's kind of looking like it might not eventuate um, currently with, with Flanagan, but plenty of other players thrown on that interchange bench. We'll run through uh, them for you for through one through uh, 26. Tyrell Sloan, who we'll talk about a lot tonight, he gets another opportunity in the fullback position. Uh, Zach Lomax on the wing once more, along with Michaeli Ravalawa, with Moses Sully and Jack Bird in the centres. Kyle Flanagan is the 5'8", Ben Hunt the half and captain. Francis Molo, Jacob Little, Blake Laurie is the front row for the Red V. Well, the back row of Tom Eisenhuth, who I thought put himself in some really good positions um, when the Dragons run under, under the pump in that first half. He's in one back row position alongside Jaden Sewer and Jack DeBellin will be wearing the 13. Uh, Jesse Marsh gets an opportunity on the interchange bench. He, um, he actually came off the extended bench for the Dragons last week uh, when, when the game was kind of falling away and when it was New South Wales Cup players against New South Wales Cup players. So he might get a few more minutes uh, on Saturday night. 15, Viliami Fafida. 16, Bernard murdoch Masilla, 17, Ray Fatala Mariner. 18, Michael Molo. 19, Connor Malizan. Uh, 20, Kristen Torbalotu. 21, Matt Fiennay. 22, Sione Finau. 23, Matt Fiennay. Uh, the brothers Toby and Ryan in jerseys, 24 and 25. And Dan Russell, who he didn't see last week uh, comes in in jersey number 26. So not a whole lot of changes, Kurt. Um, yeah, interesting to to see. I, I thought initially Flanagan name a, a full strength side, but then on uh, on the great uh, website of LeagueUnlimited.com where you can um, we'll give a quick plug to those guys because they, they do some really, really quality independent uh, rugby league media. Um, they, uh, I, I saw that most of the other NRL sides outside of the four clubs that are going to be playing in Vegas have, have pretty much got full strength sides. Uh, Barra bar obviously missing a, a few players uh, through injuries and, and resting and all of those kinds of things. But yeah, he's, he's named a full strength side, as has Benji Marshall from the, the West Tigers. A couple of tweaks there that we still won't see Hame Sele. The Dragons fans are going to have to wait until round one until that happens, Kurt. But yeah, uh, your analysis on, on this side name for, for the Dragons and I guess some of the players dropping out and some of the players coming back in for the Red V. Yeah, I'm not surprised, and I, I don't have to add too much to that, Jack. You've done a pretty good job there. Um, I, look, I, I think Flanagan, like I, we've, we've touched on, I might have mentioned last week, I think Flanagan's taken the preseason quite seriously, which he should, um, getting some runs in the legs for um, for his starters and, and seeing maybe 
if there's a few surprise packets. So, yeah, no surprises there. I'm excited to see what they can do this week on the back of the first 40 minutes from uh, from Saturday night. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, a strong side named by the Dragons. Uh, yeah, just looking at the West Tigers side, they've got some some real quality out there as well. So I think it's going to be a really good test for, for both clubs. Obviously, the Tigers coming off a, a pretty impressive uh, preseason week one where they defeated a good Warrior side, a stacked Warrior side um, uh, as well. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good little challenge. And, yeah, I was just, when I was kind of chatting off-season to Kurt, I kind of compared it to uh, the NFL where, yeah, any any of the American football fans out there will know that, yeah, week three of preseason is is normally the... the uh, the, the week or the game where we see the starters play uh, well into the third quarter um, just to try and get some um, some running in the legs, some fitness in the lungs and, and, and trying to get those combinations working, especially for the offense. And, and maybe that's the way that a lot of coaches are, are kind of slanting now, especially someone like a Shane Flanagan. Um, I, I'm not under any illusions. I, I don't think he's necessarily settled on the 17 that he's going to go with into that round one game up uh, up on the Gold Coast against the Titans. I, mean, I think it gives him another opportunity to, to look at players and yeah for someone like a Tyrell Sloan who we'll talk about in, uh, in, in a little bit it's another opportunity for him to try and I guess impress the coaching staff but then guys like Jesse Marsh he comes out and, and has a, a blinder of a game he kicks well and plays well then maybe th- there might be an opportunity for, for him on the bench so yeah great to see uh, some of these uh, younger players get another opportunity and uh, yeah great to see uh, a full strength side named by Shane Flanagan for the Dragons uh, this weekend. Well, the Dragons went down on Saturday night and Shane Flanagan had a few remarks. He was chatting to NRL.com uh, in regard to uh, the performance of his side um, over the weekend. And uh, his quote as he was speaking to Brad Walter, uh, one of the NRL, uh, NRL.com journalists, was, the first half will give it a tick, the second half will give it a cross. So that was his analysis on what he thought uh, transpired in that uh, that 80 minutes Um Obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of break down both the first and second halves in our, um, our match review uh, in a little bit. Um, but just some of the comments from, from Flanagan um, uh, you know, kind of post uh, that game on Saturday. He said, I thought that the first half was really a really good competitive game. We had our team on. And then in the second half, it just probably shows where we are with our young kids. Uh, they are not up to it just as yet, and they got run over in the second half. But when we had our best team on in the first half, I think it was a good hit out. There were some uh, big blocks of defense, and both sides scored tries off errors from the opposition. He f- he goes on uh, further down and says, um, offensively, we, we could have been a bit sharper, and we should have nailed a few tries. Uh, Sloaney should have picked the ball up and walked over the try line. He made another break and didn't find the right pass. He had two people inside him, so he left a couple of tries out there in the first half. Um, and then he also uh, spoke about... Um, um, the, the fact that um, Tyrell Sloan and Zach Lomax didn't swap um, positions during the game. I mean, he said it was due to some back spasms that Zach Lomax had been, uh, that had been occurring for him prior to uh, prior to the game. I mean, he's, we've now seen him being named in this West Tigers game. So obviously there's no there's no risk of, uh, of, of him um, missing that game or that injury causing any more concern. Um, Flanagan said he, uh, in regards to talking about Zach Lomax, uh, he did okay on the wing, uh, but he struggled with a bit of a back injury the whole game, so he probably didn't see the best of him. It's a work in progress. He wasn't moving real well, so there was no point putting him back there at fullback. It was more uh, to get a bit of game time into him and get him off. He was just having some back spasms, so it's not an injury. I just never put him back on. We'll see how he pulls up during the week. I'd like to think that he can get some time against the Tigers next week. So he has been named, as has uh, Tyrell Sloan, so I dare say we might see uh, a bit more swapping between the players... Uh, this forthcoming Saturday out there at, at Mudgee, but good to see uh, some of those comments from Shane Flanagan. Of course, we'll um, extend on those a little bit later on in the podcast uh, when we do our match review of that Charity Shield game on Saturday. Staying on the news of the Charity Shield, Ben Hunt was talking to the media only a few days after the Charity Shield and identified that there needed to be a bit more trust between him and Kyle Flanagan for the latter and for both of them uh, to really excel in season 2024. Uh, so, uh, ben was talking to Wide World of Sports um, and said that, uh, yeah, there's going to be some adjustments that need to be made uh, if the partnership with Kyle Flanagan uh, is going to uh, thrive. Uh, he went on to say, I think for me, I've probably got to learn to trust him a bit more to get us around. He's a bit more of a halfback, Kyle, and he can call direction and get us around. This was speaking to Fox League uh, on Saturday night. So I've got to not take a back seat, but have faith uh, that he can do as well and I can play off the back of that. So, yeah, interesting comments 
comments from Ben Hunter. I, I guess he's kind of been someone, um, Kurt, that's been accused of overplaying his hand at times at the Dragons. I spoke last week about a couple of years ago. He'd touched the ball about more than any other player in, in the NRL. I think that might have been in season 2022. Um, probably not easy for a player that wants to have his hands on the football uh, trusting someone else because, as I mentioned last week on the podcast, Kurt, he's played with Jaden Sullivan and Junior Ramon, two young halves, two guys that probably weren't overly confident in in, in calling for the football and, and probably were more more comfortable getting the ball when it was provided to them. But you've got Kyle Flanagan, who's, I think, yeah, um, a, 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 I wouldn't say seasoned first grader, but a guy that's been in the league kind of since around 2020 um, after making his debut in, in 2018. And I guess it's positive um, somewhat to see these coins from the captain that, yeah, there, do, there does need to be a, a bit of give and take there for both those players to excel. And I guess uh, looking at it a, a, a wider view, um, a wider scope, that yeah, if those two guys are, are trusting each other and getting to work with each other, that's going to benefit the Dragons down the down the down the path. Yeah, I'm glad he said that, and I didn't I didn't actually see that. So I'm glad I heard that because I think it, it's more about Ben Hunt giving than than Kyle Flanagan and taking. Um, I, I think Ben Hunt again overplayed his hand a few times in the first 40 minutes, and and I'll get to that shortly. And again, they got stuck at certain parts of the field. So, um, look, I, I think at least he's admitting it immediately. Um, and I'm sure he's in talks every single day, uh, particularly with uh, with chain funding and about that. So, um, look, if he's already saying that, that's good. Um, um, but um, I, saw, I think we saw evidence of, of Ben Hunt kind of uh, still trying to do it all himself and getting into the game and, and trying to do things. And um, But I'm glad he said that, and I'm glad, it, in a way, he put most of the responsibility there on himself, which is the main thing. Yeah, we have seen a bit of that um, in uh, of, of late, so I guess that is some positive talk uh, for the Dragons um, moving forward. A bit of an update on Luciano Leilua. Last week when we spoke on the Red V podcast, the news that had virtually just broke, and uh, it looked as if the Dragons were kind of in a, uh, a one-horse race, but it's, uh, it looks like it might be going in a different direction now. The Canberra Raiders have entered the chat, so to speak, and, and they're looking to, to lure him uh, down south. Uh, he's currently uh, rostered to the, the or contracted to the Cowboys on a $900,000 deal. Um, whether the Raiders, uh, along with the Dragons, would be willing to pay that is, is a completely different discussion. I've kind of heard some murmurs from those close to the Dragons that, yeah, Shane Flanagan is 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 not happy. And I guess the Dragons management team would not be happy paying that kind of money and they're probably asking for, for more closer to the five five hundred six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 a season um, and probably have balked at the, the four-year contract length as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, look, we, we kind of went on a, a, about it last week, so I won't talk too much about um, uh, about the, uh, the, the the focus here on Luciano Le Lua, but, yeah, I think he would be a good signing for the Dragons. I think he would be a an explosive uh, ball wrecking player. I think he would yeah in, improve the pack and improve the depth of the Dragons a little bit more uh, than what it's currently at. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it, it might it might be a little bit of a repeat of what we're seeing with the Dragons trying to sign some other players in terms of other clubs uh, coming in. And, and, and Canberra, yeah, kind of surprised that they're a side that's kind of put their hand up to uh, to try and lure him down to the nation's capital. They, they do have a pretty stacked forward pack, and that would certainly, yeah, make their, their forward pack even more intimidating uh, down there, I, I guess, yeah, whether we, we, we'll, we'll have to wait and see to see if uh, money money talks for Luciano or whether he'd like to come back to his, his boyhood club or whether it, it might just be all a little bit of a smoke and mirrors and he just might end up staying up in the Cowboys for 2024, but it certainly looks like the the Dragons are kind of on the back burner a little bit, but we do know how quickly these things uh, can change. Um, He did meet with uh, Dragons officials last Wednesday, Luciano Leilua, and uh, yeah, maybe his uh, management party and uh, him himself have got a little bit of cold feet in regards to the Dragons, maybe not wanting to pay uh, that uh, massive amount of money, but uh, yeah, gee, would be a a nice little addition uh, to the Red V moving forward. And a last bit of uh, potent... uh, potent news about the the Dragons currently of what's going on at the club um, is in regard to Jack Bird. There's been a lot of talk about him uh, playing in that centre position for the Dragons uh, this season and he was uh, talking to the Illawarra Mercury um, over the weekend and talking about yeah, um, the the confidence that he has uh, now that uh, that Flanagan has come back um, to the club. He said, um, he revealed to the Illawarra Mercury that a sit down with Flanagan was the catalyst uh, for a shift back to the right centre role uh, that we'll see him partner with a regular right edge wrecking ball, McKay 
Hayley Ravalawa. He said, we had a talk, obviously. I played center under Flano at the Sharks. That's probably where I played my best football. So it was just the fact of getting my body right and getting back to my old self where I'm probably lighter than I was, uh, than I, than what I was at the Sharks. There was a bit of a, an agreement between me and Flano, where, where suits best suits me and where he sees me, and that was center or 5'8". So this week I'm playing center, and now I've got to put my faith back into him and prove that I'm ready for the center position and prove that I'm healthy and fit and firing on all uh, c- cylinders. So that was obviously before the uh, before the charity shield. Um, I-, I thought he was okay. I think, yeah, defense is probably the, the question mark when it comes to Jack Bird. I think, yeah, from someone that's played in the Ford Pack previously and the, the, the strong frame and, and running style that he has when he really commits to his rugby league shows that, yeah, he's someone that is going to be able to get the Dragons out of trouble when they've got the ball inside their own 20 meter line inside their own quarter line, Kurt. But yeah, for me, it's those defensive decisions. And I guess the the way that I I look at it is Jack Bird's been stuffed around so much since he's come to the Dragons. He's played center. He's played 5'8". He's played second row. He's played lock. He's been a bench utility. He's had injuries and and kind of been in and out of the side, I think. Yeah. And I'm sure this probably is the case with Shane Flanagan. If you're going to have Jack Bird at center, he needs to stay there. You can't keep, yeah, pushing him out. And, And obviously if there's injuries in the halves, He's probably the one that has to step up and and shift uh, a little bit further in and, and play in that five eighth position. But for for yeah for for I guess lack of continuity with the Dragons, they can't just be throwing Jack Bird into other positions to be Mister Fix It because I, I I think at this stage of his career he needs to focus on one position. And if that's centre, that's great. And and we'll see what uh, what he provides for the Dragons this year. That's interesting. So at the top of that, that those quotes that you said that he. He was excited to play inside Ravalawa. Is that correct? Um, he didn't say he was excited. It said uh, the the author of the article, Mitch Jennings, was saying that he was playing. He'd be playing inside of Ravalawa. Okay, because I'm looking at a, 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 a you know, like I said, I, I was watching the mini before we came on. I'm looking at a, a, a the pause telly in front of me, and um, from memory, I, I'm pretty sure Bird played on the right inside Lomax. And it was mm. Tuli and Ravalier on the other side. So yeah, you're right. I, look, I, I think I look. I think these players don't even know where they're going to end up for round one. I, I think there's so many moving parts that that yeah, probably Bird's going to play centre. But yeah, you know, I, I still don't know. I, like mm. I, I know he's committed and he's and he's saying they're all the right things. But yes, it's but- one thing to say all this, and it's the other one to actually. Yeah, well, talk, get out there and do it. Talk is, talk is cheap, good isn't it? That are, that are out there. Sorry, talk is cheap, isn't it? Like it's yeah, like as as much as Flanagan said the right things, and we're hearing the players say the right things. It means nothing if the Dragons lose their first six um, to start the season. Oh yeah, oh, but specifically just about Jack Bird is mm-hmm. like he, he. It sounds like he might be trying to bump, you know, pump himself up a little bit too. I'm worried about him with the tenors. I, I really am. I'm still worried about Suley, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but the, the defensive reads on the left side with Kyle Flanning and, and kind of almost the same as last year, like uh, two steps forward, one sideways, and the other team's, you know, always got this natural flow on an attack. Um, I, I, look, I, I hope that Jack Bird turns out to be the centre he wants to be and that his coach wants him to be. Um, but I, I think it won't last long if he gets caught out a couple of times in the first few rounds. That That's mm. how quickly I think it'll turn. Um, but look, for all uh, intents and purposes right now, the Dragons want Jack Bird to be a centre. Jack Bird wants to be a centre and his coach wants him to be a centre. Whether that works out that way, that's another story. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because, yeah, I think he's, he's someone that had success at Cronulla in the centres, but that was, yeah, that was a long time ago. And, and we've, we've spoken about it until, until we've been, we've, we've kind of been blue in the face a little bit, Kurt, um, because yeah, I, I think he's, um, yeah, he's, he's someone that I think could be a really serviceable um, kind of player for, for the Dragons. Like I, I don't think, yeah, he's, he's someone that you necessarily look at that's going to, he's not going to be centre of the year and, and finish with 15 tries and, and 25 tries or anything like that. But yeah, I think for, for me, the, the defensive um, reads and the defensive play is probably the, yeah, the key thing that they, they need to, they need to get right, isn't it? Because I think, yeah, if, if he's kind of caught out of position a few times, then that could, that could spell kind of big danger for the Dragons. Yeah, and I'm not just talking about Jack Bird now, but but again, I, I'm talking about looking closely at the defensive reads again from Saturday night on both sides of the field. Um, I think there's, if anything else, defensively, the Dragons are shoring up some positions very quickly defensively in their structures, but the, the outside, um, the outside backs are still... That, that's the most dangerous thing. If the Dragons don't know what their outside backs are going to be for round one, 
and they're still working at the combinations defensively and against the best mm. teams, they all know what they're doing. And I think that's that's the big issue for the Dragons. Doesn't matter how good they get their full pack for round one, I think they're still going to get caught um, on, on the edges and the fringe uh, outside. So uh, fingers crossed it all works out, but I, I'm I'm still not sure what um, the Dragons outside backs. It might be the same blokes and the same faces that we, we predict for round one, but we just don't know where they're going to be yet. Uh, we're going to continue our top 25 St. George Illawarra account, and we're almost at number one. We've got the silver medal uh, this week, uh, celebrating the number two player on the top 25 St. George Illawarra players to commemorate the 25 years of the joint venture, which happened at the, the back end of the 1998 season. And no, coming in at number two this week is former Illawarra and St. George Illawarra 5'8", Trent Barrett, um, who was a wonderful player of many years for the Dragons. I think he gets uh, a really bad rap could I think Dragons fans are very harsh towards Trent Barrett I think they've created somewhat of a narrative um, about him um, in in regards to injury and not performing in in big games Um, and maybe some of that is true to an extent but I think when you look at Trent Barrett's career outside of kind of 99, that, that first year where he was um, it, it, partnered with Anthony Mundine in the halves, and then kind of the, the 04, 05, 06 sides. Um, like, I think he, he had to do a lot of the heavy lifting his own. When you look at him winning, winning the Dally M in, in 2000 um, with a side that, that finished outside the top eight to getting some pretty bang average Dragon sides to semi-final appearances in, in 2001 and 2002. Obviously, that 04 to 06 period is is one that's looked back in, looked back on with a lot of heartache from a lot of fans. Um, but I, I, I think it's... Um, I just think it's plain wrong to, to kind of pin that on on Trent Barrett. Um, I, I think, yeah, it was, it was a poorly coached side and um, they didn't reach their potential because of, um, yeah, kind of the, the, uh, the, the, the coaching at that level when they were, they were out coached by some some other teams but I guess focusing on Trent Barrett I, yeah I, I I loved watching him as a as a kid Kurt like I was probably really getting into rugby league when when he started to hit his straps um I, I think I 1999 was probably the first year that I kind of can vividly remember listening to to Dragons games on the radio going to a few games um live at, at Cogra and down at Wollongong and he was kind of a, a big part of those Dragons sides over the next few years when they weren't very good and then even there when they were um not to not to kind of mention that yeah he was a, a great player for New South Wales and, and Australia. I'd love to kind of get your recollections on on, on Trent Barrett and, and his career, uh, more specifically at the Dragons, kind of from that, that 99 to, to 05 period. But yeah, I, I guess we're kind of talking St. George Illawarra, but gee, he was also... A pretty uh, a pretty boom rookie, um, yeah. When he when he came through the Steelers in the mid to late nineteen nineties as well. Um, so yeah, what, what what are your thoughts on on Trent Barrett coming in at number number two this week, mate? Yeah, look, I, I, you can just imagine the scouts back in the day. Uh, I think he's from Tamora, mm. coming through Bush Footy. Uh, imagine those scouts back in the day, just absolutely frothing, just because he was one of those kids that was always destined to play first grade. Just yeah. Just had it look like a first grader, um, and and look, I, I, Andrew Johns may have said this in the past as well. But if you are going to build the perfect half size speed um, uh, guile, that's not a word we use very often, but nice. um, uh, 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 body shape, um, his ability to to take a tough run, um, hit the line, or, or just ball play. Uh, I think at times. Now, this might suck, but and I might have said this before, but I think at times, particularly after the merger and he became a St. George Illawarra Dragon, and, and specifically after Anthony Mundine quit the boxing, I, I think Barrett was burdened with the weight of history mm. um, and in turn the, the pressure of fans as well. Um, and it got tougher as well. It, got, it did get tougher. Particularly, not in those tough seasons when not much was expected, or they made the finals and you know week two or whatever. But you know those prelims against West Tigers and stuff like that, where maybe there was too much too much expectation on him. Where there, and I think I've said this before as well, the right players, particularly legitimate halfbacks, weren't put in place inside him. Um, he was the poster boy for the Dragons for a long time, and and yeah. And I could be wrong here, and, and Red V listeners, you can correct me here. I'm just a neutral, but from my memory, Trent Barrett never played a bad game. There was either Trent Barrett man of the match or the Trent Barrett normal game. And and to explain that is 
a Trent Barrett normal game is he's still one of the best players in the field, but he's not Trent Barrett man in the match. And and I think that some people maybe occasionally took him for granted as well. Um, because like you said, there, there were some teams th- that they shouldn't have gone as further uh, as far as they did. Mm. Um, and then when the, when there were matches there to be won, he, he was there like that. That prelim against West Tigers, as a West Tigers fan, uh, and one of the most incredible nights of rugby league in the history of the game at the City Football Stadium, the Dragons came back, and and uh, and I've said this before on this podcast. It wasn't it wasn't a Trent Barrett dummy and go or, or anything like that. I think a, a Thompson or a Bailey or, or someone ran a decoy off the hooker and he went straight through up the middle and took the tough line through the props and scored it on the post and set up, let's go boys. Mm. And now we're back. That, 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 that's the Trent Barrett. That, there was no such thing as a bad Trent Barrett game. Uh, maybe now I've got a flashback of him getting a call back in Orange and, and trying to knock Greg Nolan's head off, which wasn't yeah. his go. Um, but that was, that was signs of frustration from the state itself more than Trent Barrett. But as a dragon, I, I know he played for other clubs after that and whatever, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's very, very harsh for, for Dragons fans, particularly with, with time now and, and, you know, so much time has passed, to go back and say, well, Trent Barrett, Trent Barrett should have done this and we could have won the comp. That, I mean, who's saying that? That's not fair. I, I, and I think he he's truly one of the best Dragons, St. George of mm. Dragon players that, that you've ever had. Yeah, and that's why he's that's why he's number two. I thought he was a wonderful player. Lucky, like he, he 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 debuted in 1996 and in 1997. Admittedly, in a, a competition that was split, he was playing State of Origin at the age of uh, the age of 19. So I think yeah, from from an uh, from an early age, they knew that he was going to be uh, going to be a star. And unfortunately, rugby like it's bloody hard to win a premiership in 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 the NRL. But in any any sport that that, that you play, any competition from the pros all the way down to to park footy or, or whatever. It is so. Like, I, I don't think the measure of a man should be that he's won a that he's won a premiership. Like, I I don't know. Does will Jerome Luai go down as one of the best five eights of all time because he's won three premierships in a row? Maybe not. Uh, he might he might end up winning a, a few more with the Tigers. I'm sure Curtis would would love that. But yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think the measure of a player necessarily is how many premierships they've won. And I think sometimes Trent Barrett is is um, is judged on the lack of premierships that he had um, in his career. But I, I I just remember the things he did for New South. Wales, the things he did for Australia. I remember uh, in 2002, um, he played one of those Trent Barrett man of the match games that that, that Kurt was mentioning um, against Newcastle. Um, admittedly, Andrew Johns had been knocked out of the game early, but uh, I remember him, yeah, scoring an individual solo try, um, yeah, running to the northern end, I think, of what was it, Energy Australia Stadium back then, um, up in Newcastle, and winning winning the game, and and yeah, he, he's always a player that I've had a soft spot for, and knew how to find the line. Two hundred and thirty five first grade games in Australia for eighty two tries. Um, yeah, found it regularly early in his career with Illawarra, um, and yeah, like I think there's a, a lot of focus on Mundine and Blacklock and and those kind of guys in in ninety nine, but I think Trent Barrett played just as important a part in in the success of of the Dragons that year, and 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 for several years after that. Um, as, as well, because yeah, go, go Jack, through, yeah. I was just going to ask a question. I, I think I asked this last week on, on Lance Thompson's birthday about why he got squeezed out of the Dragons, mm. and I'm trying to I'm trying to put two and two together. I know Barrett went to the, the Sharks, yeah. Either to re- was it to replace Kamali or play with Kamali? But can you remind me off the top of your head, or or maybe by a, a second or two here, why did he leave the Dragons and go to the Sharks? He actually went to the Super League first, so he left the Dragons. Oh, oh that's right. Sorry, yeah, yeah. he went to um, Wigan. Yeah. yeah, he went to Wigan for 2007 and yeah, 2008. Okay. Um, and, yeah, like, I, I would love to get him on the podcast because, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it might have just been the case of... He was yeah, kind of jack of all the um, all the pressure. Like it's yeah, it's a um, yeah, it's a, a tough environment. Like I don't think the fans, I don't think as us as fans, kind of know yeah how difficult it is for is for players and especially for those dragon sides that were successful and and should have won premierships in in that era. So perhaps he wanted to to move away. Um, yeah, was kind of surprised when he he came back to Cronulla, but I guess wanted to move back to Australia and was able to get a couple of seasons out of it. And and yeah, it was kind of ironic that yeah he was playing for Cronulla in two. 2010 in his final year when the Dragons were off winning a premiership and 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 Cronulla well six weeks from the end of the season Shane Flanagan took over as their coach and and obviously they were able to rebuild but at that time they they were a pathetic side the Sharks so it was a yeah it was an unfortunate way for him 
to end his first grade career. And um, yeah, but I, I'm I'm someone that's a, that's a, a massive fan of him, and he slides in at number two. So yeah, yeah, you probably don't need to be a, a mathematician to work out who's number number one, or you can do your maths and cross off or who's who's already been done, who hasn't. But uh, we will reveal at number one next week uh, on the Red V Podcast. Trent Barrett coming in at number two this week. Let's uh, continue by talking a bit of Dragons history by jumping in and taking a look at a few birthdays this week. Certainly some uh, re- more random birthday uh, celebrations than we've had in recent weeks that might kind of test the memory bank of a few fans. The first birthday uh, is uh, coming up today, turning 65 today, is former Illawarra and St. George winger Shane McKellar. Now, Shane played in the 1980s. Played a total of 98 first grade games in the NRL, uh, scoring 47 tries and also kicking eight goals. He actually... Uh, excuse me, started his first grade career with the St. George Dragons in 1980. He played 16 games in that season, uh, crossed the stripe for three tries and also kicked six goals. He played in 1981 and helped the uh, the Newtown Jets to that 1981 grand final against Parramatta, scored five tries in 15 games, but then uh, became a, an established member over the next couple of seasons for the Illawarra Steelers, part of the very first ever Illawarra Steelers side in 1982. And he was prolific for uh, the Scarlet Red White because uh, he scored uh, 13 tries from 22 games in 1982 and a further 18 tries in 1983 and then finished his career with 20 games and 8 tries over the next couple of seasons uh, with the Eastern Suburbs Roosters in 1984 um, and 1985. So um, yeah, a, a very quick player, a decent finisher um, with, the, with the football and uh, we should very happy. 65th birthday to Shane, hopefully he's enjoying it and uh, yeah, a, a nice reminisce of his time spent with both the St. George Dragons and the Illawarra Steelers. Later on this week, a, a someone that is is held in low regard by a lot of Dragons fans, especially those that supported them in the 1990s, is Ben Custo, who will be celebrating his birthday on Friday. Uh, ben uh, played 59 first grade games in the NRL, probably more well known for the last few seasons that he had at the Parramatta Eels uh, rather than the Dragons. He played uh, three games as a youngster uh, in the 1996 season for the Dragons and then played 10 games each in 1997 and at 1998. Certainly didn't kind of put his best foot forward in terms of the performances on the field for the Dragons, or at least that's probably opinions of myself and, and other fans. Uh, but he was someone that, yeah, did absolutely crush it uh, in reserve grade and also in President's Cup. One of those players that, yeah, playing lower grades was a little bit too easy for him and, and probably didn't quite have the talent to, to excel at, at first grade level. Still, though, he played 59 first grade games, 23 of those for the Dragons, and did score two tries. Uh, in that three-year period between 1996 and 1998. 36 games for Parramatta in 99 and 2000, was ruled out with an injury in 2001 and came back and played six more games uh, for Parramatta in the year 2002. And then in 2001, finished off his professional first grade career with 29 games and 11 tries for the uh, the Huddersfield Giants uh, in 2001. So very happy birthday uh, to Benny on Friday. He'll be turning uh, 48 and uh, we do wish him uh, the happiest of of returns. Later on during the week, uh, well, another player from that 2005-2006 era side, Ashton Sims will be celebrating his birthday on Monday. Uh, so a very happy 39th birthday uh, to Ashton. Ashton is actually uh, down doing some great work with uh, with the Group 7. He's the operations manager down there. Actually was able to have a, a bit of a yarn with him on Saturday as I went down to Collegian Sporting Complex to watch the Steelers uh, junior rep sides uh, run about. Um, but yeah, I have a bit to do with him doing some commentary down there. But uh, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet and still built like he could come out and play uh, 60 or 65 minutes in first grade uh, is is Ashton. Uh, played a total of 228 first grade games. He started with the Dragons of four spells uh, uh, at Brisbane and at North Queensland and then went over and, and had quite a decent career in the English Super League. He spent three seasons with Warrington and then played for the Toronto Wolfpack in 2018 and uh, and 2019 there. Uh, so end up actually uh, making 358 appearances. So longevity uh, career really was uh, was something special. But his first 81 appearances in first grade were with the St. George Illawarra Dragons. He represented them between 2003 and 2007 um, and uh, yeah, was part of those uh, those semi-final sides of 04, 05 and 06 and uh, yeah, then went across to, to Brisbane and uh, then North Queensland for having some 
some uh, some success over in the UK Super League. Uh, one of the one of the great guys of, of rugby league, Ashton, comes from a a, a very well known footballing family, well, a sporting family. When you think that, yeah, Ruan played uh, has played professional rugby league and is a firefighter, and CJ I think represented Australia in gridiron, and obviously Corbin and Ashton, um, along with Tarek, who who put on a monster hit. I don't know if fans saw that, but gee, I think it was George Williams that he rocked. Uh, he's over playing with Catalans at the moment it is Tarek and that was a, a bell ringer of a hit but yeah such a great family but it kind of all started with with Ashton he was the first of the the Sims boys to represent the Dragons and yeah I have uh, I have vivid memories of kind of watching him coming off the the bench and I, I guess kind of throughout the, the the podcast Kurt we often talk about bench rotation and having guys that could come off the bench and put in a solid shift and that was what it was like in that era for the Dragons because Jason Riles and Luke Bailey would come off and then Justin Poor and Ashton Sims would, would, would come on and you'd lose a little bit but you, you would still had two very solid first grade props that uh, yeah did a did a lot of, a lot of damage through the, the middle of the field what are your, what are your memories of, of Ashton Sims um, through that uh, that 2000s period at the Dragons and I guess kind of later on up until uh, 2019 when he retired from from rugby league yeah, well, firstly, happy birthday to Ashton, and, and I don't know Ashton from a bar of soap, but before I get a compliment for Ashton, which is going to completely upset the rest of his family, <laughs> I, I'm going to say, I, from what I've heard, Benny Custer is doing pretty well for himself. He, he's pretty high up in the council over Bondi Way. Yeah, so Wa- yeah, Waverley Council. I saw that when I Googled his something. name. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so he's doing something over there. But uh, anyway, so I, I've got, I, I've got some... Uh, is it? Is um, are you about to talk about the two thousand and eight semi final against Melbourne? No. Okay. No. Yeah. Because that's because no, no, unfortunately, amongst <laughs> other fans, apart from Dragons fans, but Brisbane fans, that's the one that uh, yeah that that memory gets brought up a fair bit. No, no. Look, look, look. To be to, to be clear, T's and C's. I am a neutral. I'm not a Dragons fan. Yeah, you say <laughs> that, you, mate. You say that every week, like it means something. <laughs> no, no. Listen, I'm, I'm going to say something out that maybe might be outlandish. But I think Ashton Sims was the most talented footballer of his entire family. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I, I think Tarek Sims um, has got a bit of longevity and he plays a bit wider and he can play longer and he can put a hit on. Um, but I think Ashton Sims, if I was picking a, a football team and I said, Curtis, out of, out of all the Sims players, um, and I'm including Ruan because, you know, it's NLW and she's a, a great player in her own right, a, a legend of the women's game. But I'm talking about on pure talent. Ashton seems the best best player in that family. Yeah. Um, and, and and maybe, you know, maybe – and look, he seems like a free spirit. He went over to Toronto and um, enjoyed the, the fruits of the game and, and all that mm. kind of stuff. And maybe got stuck behind a few players at a few different clubs. But but to me, and as, as an old prop – the, the one guy out of all those players that I don't want running at me or, or having a, a barnyard tussle with for 35 minutes in the middle of the field is Ashton Sims. Yeah. Big body, elbows, knees, you know, doesn't mind a, probably a bit of banner, a bit of a chat, all that kind of stuff. I, I think Ashton Sims was is the best of the Sims brothers and, and including Ryan as the sister as well, talent-wise. I, mm. I think he was a great player and, and – Maybe he just wasn't his time. Like if he played another era, um, and, and you know he might have played some more rep football or whatever. But I, I actually think he was the best yeah. of the sim. Yeah, and I, I just think like we, we talk about longevity, but this is a guy that played a lot of his a lot of his football career tight as a, as a prop as a middle exactly. forward. Exactly. Um, he played a little bit of back row. I actually was speaking to him about that when I when we had a bit of a yarn on on, on Saturday. Um, but yeah, to, to play three hundred and fifty eight first grade games um, in that era, that tough era, there's some was some bloody good forwards around that time, and then to do it over in in England where the conditions are a lot harsher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes playing in in sleet and and snow and rain and it's cold and that that has an effect on your joints on your ankles on your knees and your back and hips and everything like that so yeah I, 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 and he's much bigger he's much bigger than the rest of them too isn't he yeah well I don't I, I've six, never three, six, four? I, yeah he's very he's very very big um, he, he towers over me um, I, 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 you're I, a big bugger as well Jack I'll well, sit next to you and I, I forgot how tall you were yeah that's right mate I haven't got much in between the shoulders but uh, I've got I've got a bit of height <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've, I've never I've never stood toe to toe with Tarek Sims, I, I think that would be an intimidating thing, but yeah, I, I, he is a, he, he is a big guy, and um, yeah, I, I just yeah, it's 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 always nice to kind of tip our cap and uh, 
um, yeah, look back on these players throughout their throughout their careers. And um, yeah, he's someone that yeah. Now down in Group Seven territory, yeah, he, he said the other day, my my heart's still a Dragons. I'm, I'm still a Dragons fan. That's that's the that's the team that I I'll flip when I flip the TV on. I want to be watching the Dragons and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, we uh, we salute uh, we salute Ashton and uh, do wish him a very happy birthday on Monday. One birthday that was in between there that I forgot to jump on uh, was a former St George halfback uh, Bobby Bugton, who unfortunately we only just lost Bob uh, last year on the 2nd of November at the grand old age of, of 87 years and 250 days. A, uh, a wonderful player. One of the, I guess the, the 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 one of the star halfbacks for the St George Dragons, part of that incredible 1950s and 60s dynasty. Um, he played 209 first grade games, 72 tries, and 33 goals, and had a phenomenal win loss record. 157 wins, five draws, and only 47 defeats. So won 75 percent of those games, and I dare say um, that not many of those would have happened at the Dragons because he did actually finish his career at Parramatta, where he did have a, a pretty good win rate, but certainly not at the same level um, as the Dragons. Uh, Made his debut um, just before that period began in 1954 and established himself in first grade in 1955 where he played 20 games and scored seven tries but was part of uh, the first six grand finals for the Dragons between 1956 and 1961. Quite remarkably, in 1959 when the Dragons went undefeated throughout the entire season, their only blemish was a draw against Balmain. He scored 16 tries in 19 games when some of those forwards and some of those dirty tactics that would have been done to halfbacks, uh, it was quite incredible that he found the try line uh, that many times. So, yeah, someone that is held in very high regard. 135 games for St. George between 1954 and 1961 for 57 tries. He won 111 games at an 82% win rate. Uh, That is really remarkable. And then went on to play four seasons at Parramatta when Ken Carney went over there and coached uh, the Parramatta side and played 74 games, 15 tries and nailed 33 goals. Uh, probably goes down as one of the great halfbacks of the St. George Dragons in, in, in the history. Obviously, there's a, a lot of great ones to, to choose from, but uh, in terms of like getting to play and winning six straight grand finals, um, Bobby Bugden's there. Um, uh, Obviously, we weren't haven't been around to, to see it and, and there isn't footage available, especially for those, those grand finals in the mid to late 1950s, but it's uh, it's quite incredible. I, I know we've kind of lost a lot of these players, Kurt, and, and that's that sadness that we, we live with as Dragons fans, but quite incredible that a guy that played first grade in 1954 up until November of last year was was still alive and still walking this earth. These they, these guys are absolute legends to the, the club, and I think probably more so at the Dragons than, than, than any other club, I think because of that successful side in the 1950s and 1960s, it's probably... Those players are held in such high esteem, more so than than I don't know other clubs that might look back on players that played in the, in the 1950s and, and the 1960s. Uh, uh, that's I say it all the time. That's why I love doing this this history section, looking back on these players because I think yeah they deserve the the credit for the their trailblazing and 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 what they've done has kind of led to to rugby league to continue to grow to kind of what we see to now in the the 2024 version, mate. Yeah, exactly, Jack. Uh, and that's why I took the time, even running late the other night, to, to stop into the Carlton Hotel because, um, you know, from all from all stories, is is that that's where a lot of the players after training mm. used to go up and have beers and, and all the rest. And, um, and from what I understand, you know, and you, you stole my thunder a little bit, uh, Carney had a falling out because he was getting replaced by Walsh and, and Carney wanted to go across the Parramatta. And I think Bubden may have had a falling out with the club yeah, as he well. Was, he was, yeah, he was getting forced out at the, the same time mm. as well, yeah. But, but, but that's, the, that's the ruthlessness of the Dragons at the time. So well, I don't they had, think he, they had I don't think he would have taken it personally because no. he would have walked into that club at the same time when he was a kid and had to buy his time in reserve grade to take someone else's spot. That's what Frank Facer created at that club, right? Yeah, and they they had Billy Smith, who was one yeah. of the the great. When you talk of the the greatest halfbacks of all time, it's it's probably of, of St George history. It's probably him and Bog Bugden that are that are kind of neck and neck. So, yeah, no, no, legend, absolute legend. I, I, yeah, you've done well, Jack. I, I don't know. There's nothing else I can add to that. 
Yeah, and it's always great. If you go into Rugby League Project, there's so much information about players. You can see how many games they won, how many they lost, how many games they played, tries, goals, all of that kind of stuff. But one of the lo- the, the features I love is that people have been able to, to, to leave comments, and these are just some of the comments about Bob Bugden, um, a great halfback for the Dragons, late 50s, early 60s, fast and elusive and a strong defender. And then someone else said, I worked with Bobby in real estate for about four years. We became very good friends. Would love to get back in contact with him if possible. Um, and yeah, just just talking about the the uh, the great uh, the, the the great man that he was, and and that's the thing. These guys are, uh, are fathers and grandfathers and and brothers and uncles, sons, friends uh, away from rugby league, and it's yeah, it's always great to to get a chance to to hear about the the people they were away from uh, rugby league, uh, and uh, we do, we love to do that every week here on the Red V podcast. Before we finish off our Dragons news and updates section, let's do the Who Am I for this week, and this particular player played a total of 144 first grade games across their career, which spanned from their debut year in 1996 until they retired at the end of the 2003 season. Uh, They played, as I mentioned, 144 games, but they also scored 48 tries and kicked 28 goals in that period and played fullback. The breakdown of their career is quite simple. Uh, For the first three seasons, they played at the Illawarra Steelers between 1996 and 1998, playing 45 games 11 tries and 9 goals. They then went across and, and effectively spent the rest of their career on the Northern Beaches, although in a couple of different uh, facets. 1999 with the Manly Seagulls, uh, 20 tries, four, uh, sorry, 20 games for 4 tries and 14 goals. Then as we know, history tells us that over the next 3 years they were the Northern Eagles, so this particular player played uh, with the Northern Eagles between 2000 and 2002. 30 tries, 5 goals in 66 appearances, and then uh, when Manly turfed the uh, North Sydney Bears away, uh, they got to uh, get, get their naming rights back, and uh, yeah, in 2003, this particular player played a further 13 games for Manly and three tries. He was also born in Young, uh, and then grew up in the Riverina town of Quandiala in country New South Wales, and uh, Illawarra actually uh, helped him uh, relocate uh, to Wollongong and play for the Steelers there. He got a scholarship offer uh, from them, and uh, he obviously spent his first three seasons at the Illawarra Steelers, um, and then um, he, his career came to a bit of a premature end in 2003. He had a chronic knee and back injury, and he retired at the end of the 2003 season. And Peter Peters said about this particular player, so-and-so's loyalty to Manly has been great and won't be forgotten. He has been a wonderful player and an uh, inspiration to the young players coming through, as well as being an inspirational player. He was an excellent club man. I've got a few more um, clues up my sleeve, Kurt, but has that given you any enough information to have an inkling on who you think it might be? Yep. Oh, you do? You know. Got it. Yeah, he's... Um, I don't know if he's captain coaching Oakdale this year. I think he's been moved Ooh. on. He might be, might be there again this year, but there's another tidbit um, from so the local area. So he's, 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 so he's been coaching in, in your in your neck of the woods, mate? Yeah, sorry. I might, sorry, I'll take that back. Not captain coaching. He, he has been coaching. Um, and I know for a fact he did coach Oakdale in the last couple of years. I was about to but, say, uh, Captain Coach, he's uh, 47 yeah, going on 48 yeah, yeah. this year, so body yeah, must be holding the, up well considering he retired no, from NRL. No, <laughs> the, the competition's much better than that. But, um, yeah, he's uh, he's been around up here a little bit and um, a little bit like um, – uh, I don't want to take any shine off um, – off, uh, I was better give the name away there, but um, <laughs> a, a, another player, um, another former Dragon, Simon Wolford, mm. who's um, actually coaching Picton this year too. So anyway, yeah, like a toiling fullback that didn't get much wrong um, and kind of grew up playing around some really good fullbacks at the Steelers in those 90s that kind of went on to other clubs like uh, Riolo, O'Meara, some other blokes too. So I'll leave it for someone else, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've got it. Yeah, I don't know if he's still teaching, but uh, as late as, as 2018, he was coaching at Camden High and was very passionate about the rugby league program they had uh, through there as well. So yeah, that uh, that region um, is 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 one that yeah might give a bit more of a clue of uh, the player this week on uh, the Who Am I for the Red V podcast. Time for us to take our first break here on episode 214 with Jack Clifton and Curtis Woodward. The other side of this break, we're going to review the Charity Shield loss against the South Sydney Rabbitohs. We're going to talk about that performance in the second and half, but more importantly, we're going to talk about the first 40 minutes and why we think it was so impressive for the Dragons and why it could be a key for them moving forward in season 2024. 
Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Hope you're enjoying the podcast for another week. As always, you can get in contact with us here at the Red V Podcast via our email, redvpodcast at gmail.com. Well, the Dragons finally got a chance to hit the field in a first grade capacity for the annual Charity Shield for the first time ever held at Cogra Oval on Saturday night. South end up uh, running out easy winners in the end by 28 points to six, but that scoreline doesn't accurately reflect uh, how good the Dragons were in different uh, periods of that game. Kurt, I know you've got your own opinions on uh, on the Dragons and, and kind of what transpired, and I'll, I'll kind of throw to you in a sec, but I, I kind of thought I would just kind of lay everything out on the table for what I thought um, transpired for the Dragons in in the first, uh, well, at least the, the first 40 minutes, because I feel, if anything, the, the second 40 minutes, all that showed us, and Shane Flanagan said it perfectly as we quoted him from that uh, uh, from that NRL.com article earlier in our uh, news section, was all it showed is that the, the, the Dragons young players, the Dragons, the Dragons depth players, probably not up to stand to to be competing um, in, in the NRL, um, may, maybe at times this year, but certainly need need some some more assistance um, there. I think that's all the the second half showed us when South um, scored twenty two unanswered points to win twenty eight points to six. If you go back and watch the game, the first forty minutes by the Dragons, I think was very impressive. This was against a Ford pack that boasted Keon Kolamatangi, Tom Burgess, Cam Murray, Jacob Host, Tavita Totola, um, Davy Mawali, like that. A, that is a legit Ford pack. That's not a New South Wales Cup or Jersey flag um, type attack that's being thrown out. Yes, they were missing Latrell Mitchell and Cody Walker and uh, Damian Cook and um, uh, there's one other that I'm missing in there as well. Yes, they were missing some backline players, but and and that very well could have, have made the scoreline even different. But when you look at what the Dragons Ford pack did, they they repelled South time and time away, uh, time and time again away from their own defensive line. I thought, yeah, they looked a fitter side. The body shapes are very different. Flanagan had said that to Dragons fans, and he'd said that in the media, that, that come round one, you'd see some different body shapes. Well, we've seen some prior to, to round one. I thought the fitness was good. Um, there was, yeah, some real commitment and communication. Obviously, Curtin and I were, were at the game, and, and I went home um, the, the next day and, and, and watched some of the, the KO Mini version of it, and you could hear the, the loudness and the tone in, uh, in the voices of these Dragons players. So I think it was very positive. Um, I, I think the the pylon from fans and the media has been way over the top. I feel like there's this uh, there's this need as Dragons fans now to constantly put the boot in when we lose a game. Um, and I think any time you lose a game doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, that's a negative outcome. For me, I was very impressed with the defense. Uh, the, I thought the attack was poor. I thought it was clunky. But even so, um, Tyrell Sloan, who we'll speak about in a moment, 
Um, I thought, yeah, he, he squandered at least three tries there, and 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 then made an error which led directly to a to a South try. So the Dragons could have easily been up eighteen nil, and then, yeah, whatever you want to take from that, they could have even added more points. Who knows what the confidence would have would have happened throughout the whole squad? So yeah, I, I was. I'll throw it over to you now, Kurt. But I was very impressed with what we saw, especially from the Ford pack. I thought Frankie Molo was immense. I saw. I thought um, Eisenhuth put himself in some really good positions. I think that showed what a quality player he is coming from um, another system it, it just yeah just being in doing doing just having some really high football IQ moments of, of putting himself in in good positions um, I, I thought he was very impressive um, yes yeah, Sua and Sully had some damaging runs which I liked um, yeah I, I was I was happy with Little's performance in the hooker role um, yeah I, I just thought overall defensively and I think that's the most important thing here um, defensively the Dragons were very sound and probably um, were, were the better forward pack when you look throughout the, the 40 minutes, I thought they, they got over the advantage line a bit more than their their opponents. And as I mentioned, that Jacob Host try came directly from an error where the defense basically had no chance to defend it. So I was, um, yeah, I was very impressed with, with what I saw in that first 40 minutes. So uh, what, 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 what are your notes? What your take on, on the performance over the weekend? Yeah, look, I, I'm not one. And look, it's very rare for me to, to have a go at Dragons fans. I don't think I've, I, I, used, I, I can't remember the last time if I've ever done it. Um, just, just pull it back in a bit. Put your socks back up because this was a, a really good performance. And I'm only talking about the first 40 minutes because that's all that matters. It, truly, that's all that matters. Um, and, and you're talking about body shape and stuff like that. And Timmy Bouchard, who, who like I've mentioned a couple of times now, up on the hill, he actually said he was down watching the warm up and he's talking about Molo's body shape and all this yeah. stuff. And, how he's trimmed down and and um, look and and we, we are doing this a little bit different tonight because I, I I did watch it and I just put it in dot points. So uh, first and foremost, I, I thought the intensity at the start of the game was was great and they kept it up through that first half as best they could um, for their first hit out and and like you touched on, Sloan is is another issue and and we will yeah huge issue. That several chances and it wasn't just Sloan. There were, there were chances there off a bomb with Eisenhuth and all the rest. So they got into South um, and, and, and they got into South um, back, um, back lay. They got into backfield. They, they had chances to score those tries um, on another, on another night. If it wasn't the first night of the year, maybe a bit of pressure and a bit of nerves. Um, I, I think they take advantage of those chances, and it's a, a very different looking scoreline at half time. Um, and and look, from what Flanagan said, even if the Dragons were up eighteen nil at half time or eighteen six, from what Flanagan said, they probably get run down anyway. Um, I agree that Jacob Little looked very sharp. Um, I, there are some things for me about Ben Hunt again that that I'm still worried about, and I'm glad that you brought up the comments about Ben Hunt because from even on the fifth minute of the game, on the fourth tackle, Ben Hunt takes on the tri- on the line on the short side, and they're only 15 meters from the line, and literally Jacob Little looks up on the last tackle. It's a slow play the ball, so Souths are set already. And Cole Flanagan still decides to go blindside. And I can actually see Little looking up going, mm. are you sure you want the ball? And he actually he actually gives Flanagan the ball. They get jammed and Flanagan loses the ball. Um, Lomax starting on the wing and stayed out there. I, I thought he looked good, which is even more impressive if, if Flanagan's telling the truth and he's got back yeah. spasms because he yeah. looked like a good target on the field. Um, and, and when the ball went Lomax's way, particularly in the air, South kind of got a little bit desperate and, and they're the things we've been talking about in this podcast is that make yourself as dangerous as you can for the opposition. And I thought um, uh, Lomax for the Dragons were a target and in turn made South a little bit worried. Um, in the 12th minute, uh, again, a, the, a shift goes right. They lose their shape. The ball goes down. South pick it up, and you think, here we go. South's going to be away for the prize. Lomax gets back, gets a little bit of help, and chucks him over the sideline. I love that. The crowd went up for that. Mm. Um, this is the stuff I'm looking for if I'm a Dragons fan. The, the, the reactions and intensity and the ruck speed. So this is all very good. 15th minute, Dragons left side 
in defence has a lot of work to do. Um, South had barely any ball down on the attacking line at the northern end in the first 20 minutes. And and if, if you go back and look at it, I, I think it was the 15th minute, and it looked like last year. So, again, Flanagan, Suley, Ravalau on that side, I'm not mm. going to trust that as a defensive side all year if that's what Shane Flanagan comes up with. Um, the ball went right, and Flanagan took a step backwards – then sideways, then backwards, then came up. And Suley and Ravalawa, there was no communication at all. And luckily for them, the, the South kicked for the end goal on the third tackle and Ravalawa knocked it dead. Um, at the 20th minute, now remember this is quarter play, so this affects what this play would have been. So Flanagan at first receiver goes direct to the line with the ball and drops Laurie back on the inside. There's a six again. If this is a 40-minute game, they, they reset and Hunt comes back to the middle. But at that point, because they know the, the bell's going to go, they go right and and Hunt doesn't open up anything on the right. All he does is he telegraphs and loops a pass out to Lomax. He has to kick. It's quarter time. Um, 13 minutes before halftime, Ben Hunt strangles his own team again right down the, the right side something he's been known for, and I've banged on about it at nauseam with Ben Hunt. Again, this is about Ben Hunt. He's already admitted this week he, he doesn't trust Flanagan yet. But mm. why are they still going to the right-hand side? They looked really good down the centre of the field with Little and the they props. Did. I think Burdock, mm. it was Burdock Masilla with a really good run. Even the commentators on that KO Mini going, how good do the Dragons look? And then Hunt comes right side. He runs out of room. This time it's poor Jack Bird. Yeah. He's caught with no options. He chips and it goes dead. Um, then five minutes before halftime, we know what happens with Sloan. He gets smashed by Ilias. Um, it's 6-0. And then Ravalawa jags one back on halftime. So it's 6 all. It should be nil all. But in, in my mind, for the chance of the Dragons had in that first half, they could have been winning possibly 16-0, 18-0. Yeah, yep, spot on. That, that should have been the score at halftime. Mm. That's how it went. Um, so I don't care what happened in the second half. Forget what happened in the second half. Forget what the Daily Telegraph says or clickbaits or whatever, and you're trying to get hits for your podcast. Like you said before the podcast, y- yourself, Jack, uh, for other podcasts. That first half, you guys were the better team by a mile. Mm. You guys are really good. Um, there were opportunities there to finish some tries. And then, look, and again, we, look, Terrell's – has so much work to do in his game. But going back to – because I remember we were sitting on the hill with Josh and Jack and uh, Josh's dad, and um, I was like, oh, who lost that? Everyone looked at each other and went, oh, it was Sloan. Yeah. But then I looked back on the replay, and there was already a buckling tackle. Rubble Lau got smashed. There was no one else to take the tough run, and it was just a perfect tackle. Ilias got under his ribs, and that was a great tackle. So I'm not going to blame that one on Sloan. He, he might have to learn from that and drop his body in his hip with his shoulder and take a tougher run. But apart from that, that first 40 minutes, forget the second half, forget the charity shield. I know last week I said it'd be great to win the charity shield, but for what happened in the second half, the Dragons were the better team in the first half. Yeah, That's definitely. what all you guys need to concentrate on. Yeah. And and that's why that's why I think the pylon's been a bit too much. Like people saying that there was there was there was nothing positive that came out of the game. There's a lot of positives that came out of it. Sloan Sloan is an issue, and that needs to be resolved. But in terms of what the Ford Pack have done, like the I love the aggressive nature of of Frank Molo. We've we've seen it from Sewer before. I thought DeBellin was solid through the middle. Like there was some really promising signs from from the team. So yeah, I, I would and and obviously that that might not count for much if if they come out and and they don't play great against the Tigers on Mudgee at Saturday, but it's also preseason. I think, yeah, the Dragons are well, are, they, are they the only club that's that's come into come into the new season with a new coach? So yeah, it's there's going to be some teething pains with combinations, and Flanagan's still trying to find out what what the best Dragon side looks like. So I, I wasn't overly overly concerned as I, as I mentioned before, Kurt. I think yeah, all the second half showed us that is that the depth players, the young players, just aren't quite ready yet. They they need a bit more training. They 
They need a bit more guidance. Um, and, and it's hard when you've got reserve graders playing with reserve graders and, and they haven't necessarily trained together or the combinations aren't coming together. Um, so, And when you fall behind um, uh, like, like they did, it, it can be hard to, to try and pull it back. So, um, yeah, definitely some, some positives. But, um, yeah, I, I guess that when you look at the negative column, you, you kind of look at Tyrell Sloan and, yeah, look, I, I don't know where the Dragons go from here. Could I, I've been a... I've been a great supporter of Tyrell on this podcast for many uh, for many years now, fans. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll probably remember that. But yeah, I, I just don't think the Dragons can go in with him at fullback in, in round one. Um, I, I think even if he was to have a blinder against the Tigers on Saturday, I just don't think you can trust him. I think the the fundamental errors he makes like that, yeah, carrying the ball out from the back, getting, getting, getting jammed and... Uh, just popping the ball up so a, a, a player, a forward, can can run pretty much unhampered to the try line is just not acceptable. He, he bombed tries at the other end of the ground. Um, he never looks comfortable under the high ball. Um, yeah, but, uh, Jack, I will say, though, I will say that if you had, I don't know, like maybe Lomax is injured like Flanagan said, but thank God Sloan's done this in the first trial. Mm, yeah. Because he did get into back play a lot. And he did kind of get lost a little bit, like he didn't he didn't know what to do, like he wasn't confident enough. There was, I, I think, there was one point there in the first half, and it wasn't on the mini, but it's just from memory on the hill. He got on a back play, and he kind of looked around, and then kind of took the contact of the the fullback, who was not a starting fullback for South. Like, I can't remember who the fullback was, but he kind of just lost his way, and then threw it up in the air, thinking someone was going to be there. Yeah. Kind of like that's what he had to do. And he was just going for the motions because he might have been a bit nervous, or it, it, it's all it, 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 he's. They're, they're trying to recalibrate him, and I, I think it's going to be a work in progress. So, look, I, I, I think out of necessity he starts at fullback because I don't think Lomax will be ready. And and like I said before, it's going to be a rotation thing, and I don't think Sloan's going to be out of this team all year. He's going to be somewhere one to thirteen, one to seventeen all year. I think he's the biggest long term project the Dragons have. Um, but can you take a lame duck fullback into the season when you know, your side has worked their ass off to get in a position? So say say the Dragons are playing Melbourne down in Melbourne. Dragons are up 16-12, mm-hmm. and then last five or ten minutes, Sloan spills a bomb, picked up by Papanaz and scores under the post, and the Dragons lose. I just don't know if you can aff- – I, I, I get your point, and I see where you're coming from, Kurt, but I just think Tyrell Sloan's played, what is it, 36 first-grade games now. He's been part of the Dragons' first-grade setup since 2021. So he, had, he came into the side halfway through 2021 he had off season 2022 off season last year off season this year where admittedly he had an injury before preseason started but Flanagan spoke up it was going to do boxing and wrestling with him and he was going to he was going to train him up and I haven't seen any progress whatsoever in Tyrell Sloan he looks so uncertain out there that I just don't think he can I don't like I know the Dragons don't have a lot of options at fullback but uh, and, and maybe maybe he does play round one. Maybe Flanagan has more faith in him than the fan base does. But I, I would be, yeah, I, I would be very, very worried to have him lining up in, in round one. Look, I, 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 I would be more worried at this point in the defensive reads, particularly on that left side. Um, like I said, with if that's the left side you're going to go with, with Flanagan, Suley and Ravalawa, I'm more worried about them the mistakes of Sloan. And to go back to your 16-12 against Melbourne, if you're 16-12 up with five minutes to go against the Storm in Melbourne, it's probably because Sloan's been part of the attack that's got you to 16-12. That, that, that's the thing, is that he's just a... I, I don't know how to... I don't know how to explain it. If, if, if Sloan's got you up to 16-12 against Storm, or, or the Dragons are up 16-12, probably because Sloan's done something in the game to get you to 16-12 with the ball. So if you can get the other side right, even even 30% better than what it is now, you're a far more dangerous team with Sloan in the side than out of the side. And but, I think that's the way the Dragons have to play. They, they need to trust the players and get, get through it. But I just think if, if, if you're doing that, like what's the point of Tyrell Sloan scoring two tries at one end and playing great? And, and it's exactly what we saw from Matt Dufty as well when he was fullback at the Dragons. If he's letting two, like, two in at the other end, like I, I think what he does when, he's, when he gets in the backfield is great apart from what we saw in the Charity Shield. But when you look around the, the league, when you look at the good fullbacks, and there's a lot of fullbacks in the league now that are serviceable guys 
that can be relied on, they're able to do it at both ends of, of the ground. And I, I just don't think he can be carrying someone that you don't have faith that he's going to be able to field a bomb on tackle five. You don't have faith that he's going to be able to find a right pass at the other end of the ground. Like, I, I just don't think that you can, just because someone's got these wonderful attacking highlights doesn't necessarily mean they should line up in in fullback. Like, I think he, he also kind of has reservations of kind of putting his body on the line at times. And he's a, every player, every rugby league player in the history of the game is a confidence player, but he seems like someone that his confidence and his morale gets jolted massively when he makes an error. And that's, uh, that's really concerning that you've got a player in your side that has, doesn't, doesn't have the, the, uh, the versatility, perseverance to that, that, that steal, that kind of mental edge to bounce back from errors that not even the great fullbacks, just, just average middle of the road fullbacks are able to bounce back from errors. And I, yeah, like this is just my opinion, but I, I just think if the Dragons go in the season with him, I think you'll see flashes of brilliance. You'll see some stuff like we've seen the last couple of years where he's able to glide down the sideline and he's an athletic guy and he looks great and he's able to score some great tries. But is it worth seeing seeing that five or six times a game? Uh, sorry, five or six times a year. If twelve times a year you see him dropping a ball at his own goal line or making a bad read defensively or not being that not being in a good position, um, I think I think close to forty games is is more than enough. And I know kind of you you know firsthand being a Tigers fan with with Luke Brooks that was that was the argument from a lot of people. How many games does does a guy need to to show that he has the the ability in in first grade because I honestly thought that we would see uh, a dramatic shift in, in Tyrell Sloan and I know it's only been one game and maybe I'm too harsh of a judge and maybe I should wait for five or six weeks in the season but I, I didn't see any any difference from the Tyrell Sloan that we saw last season and for me considering all the talk and all the stuff that's been happening behind the scenes that that is that's probably the most concerning uh, factor for me is that we haven't seen any improvement if you'd, you'd seen something if he was a little bit different then I'd be willing to to maybe take a gamble on him and give him a bit more time but I, I just yeah I can just see this being a being a disaster Kurt him starting the season playing six or eight weeks through the season and then the Dragons realizing crap he's just not up to up to first grade stand and we've got to try and scurry and throw Zach Lomax back there or try and find a makeshift option at fullback when, yeah, the, 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 I guess there's been opportunities in, in the offseason for them to make Zach Lomax the permanent number one. Yeah, uh, look, uh, and I understand what you're saying too, Jack. I, I do 100% uh, understand where you're coming from. And, and, and I have said this before um, with when we've spoken about Sloan, particularly your doubts, is you got to remember too that that, that that spot was Ramsey's when he was killing it. Mm, um, it was, and and I think I, at one point I said he reminds me of Pappenhausen. Like he just when he when he was going in those games where he was one hundred percent fit, he was he was turning games on their head because it was just pure speed. Mm. Um, where technically he had stuff to work on his game too, um, which may with sliding doors would have helped Sloan develop his game if he was playing another position. Um, I, I think there's something too, without taking away from one of the fan corner questions and one of my answers, is is that um, I like the fact that Lomax played as long as he did on the wing, mm. which will not be his full time position, but nah. he does look he looks great on the wing. Like, I, I thought he looked great on the wing, injured. Um, so I, I think there's some moving parts there. Well, you you know, it, like I said, I, I think Sloan will never not be out of the seventeen. I, I think he is the Dragons' biggest. Um, piece of homework they got, particularly for Shane Flanagan. Mm. Um, but for right now, it's the devil you know. And I think to start round one, look, you, you've just got to trust that you've got to trust the process and that there might be a few mistakes come the start of the season. Um, but right now, just with the, the, the squad the Dragons have and the fact there isn't a guy pushing up from reserve grade, unless you can tell me otherwise, Jack, that, that Jack Sloan, uh, to, sorry, Jack Sloan, Tyrrell <laughs> Sloan is going to be your starting fullback with the possibility to, to rode some players through when or if and when Zach Lomax is fit. Mm. Um, so, look, I understand the frustration, but I think Sloan is such a long-term thing now. Did he just not re-sign? No, um, he hasn't. Really, no, there's been. Yeah, there's it been, hasn't. He hasn't resigned yet. Okay, no, and it's been. And and that's the other thing. Like I, I just, I think that would be 
that would be negligent from the Dragons. But it was so, cheap, though, though. He, he's on the cheap, though. Wasn't it 500K for a couple of years, something like that? Is, is 500 on the cheap for a guy that's played 30-odd first-grade games? And, and I, I, I think so. I think so, because if you lose him and he goes to a big club like the Roosters, he becomes a rep player within 18 months. Well, so yeah, give Flanagan the, give, I'm, give I'm willing willing the chance. To, yeah. I, I would say give Flanagan the chance to develop him because Flanagan hasn't been there to be his coach. And with all due respect to Anthony Griffin and coaching staff and administration before that, um, Sloan didn't really have direction. So I, I, I think it might be a slow burn. Um, but like I said, you've got to keep him in the team because you don't have the depth. Your kids aren't there. There's no one pushing up. So Sloan's in your team somewhere. And the fact that, uh, unfortunately, I didn't know until you just told me that, that um, Lomax is struggling with, with, with some injuries himself. Yeah, back um, spasms, yeah. Yeah, so it's positive that the funny him kept him out there, more to do with maybe, you know, match fitness and, and, and keeping him as, 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 as high to an NRL level as you can with back spasms. Mm. But I think at least for the first month, just have a look, see how he goes when the competition proper starts. But, yes, I, I, I would think from the outside looking in, Expect a few mistakes in his game still over this year, it, it, and they that that they should dwindle as the game that the season goes on. But I think he's going to win you more games than he's going to lose, and and I'd rather him in the team than just let him go and start again with someone else when there's no one else pushing up. Well, we need to uh, move on because uh, we've got plenty to get through on the on the podcast. Uh, so much dragon stuff to uh, to continue to talk about. So we'll uh, leave the, uh, the the South game for a while, and instead we'll uh, take a uh, position preview. Actually, um, looking at the the dragons uh, positions for front row and hooker. But before I mean jumping the gun, before we do that, uh, we are going to do uh, a preview of the match against the West Tigers, second week of the preseason challenge, and last of the preseason fixtures for both these uh, two sides. Um, as we mentioned at the, the top of the broadcast. Uh, Raven Fatala Mariner comes into the side. Um, yeah, Dylan Egan uh, drops out. And uh, yeah, as we mentioned, a, a fairly strong side, probably the strongest side the Dragons could name outside of, of, of having uh, Hame Sele in, uh, in in that 17 for the Dragons. Um, what are the challenges for the Dragons in, in this match, Kurt? And we might kind of be rehashing some of the stuff we've already spoken about. Um, I, I guess, yeah, what, what do you see the challenges as? Um, and do you see the starters playing more than 40? minutes or is it going to be a I guess uh, a Flanagan just uh, uh, taking a look and seeing how things develop over the game uh, and determines kind of how many minutes he's going to get out of, out of different players how do you see that that all transpiring on Saturday night yeah this is another this is another battle for the Dragons because I, I know they played the Rabbitohs last week who were a in 2024, they're a big club. They're, they're up there, right? So um, you play the Rabbitohs at Cogger and Charity Shield. Um, you're expecting something for at least the first half. Um, they need to come to play and, and be better this week, and I'm sure Flanagan will bang this into his team. Uh, because the West Tigers are bringing plays in this week that, that didn't play last week. Justin Olam and, and Stafford Toa are playing in the centres this week. That's their starting centre pairing. Alex Toll comes into the side. He'll come off the bench. This, this is a, another step up. And I know this this doesn't sound – what do you mean, Curtis? You're talking about the Rabbitohs to West Tigers. I'm talking about the, these clubs are on a similar path mm. where Benji Marshall, uh, first-year coach, um, and, and similar teams, but but I would also argue that the West Tigers fall pack this week uh, compared to Rabbitohs last week it is play to player going to be more dangerous, particularly Coruscant Hooker and a very good forward pack. Mm. I, I, I would like to see Flanagan play his team 50 minutes, maybe 55, or give him a break at halftime and maybe rotate them through the game. And, and not just bring them off at halftime, but rotate them through the game almost like it's um, more an NRL kind of match play kind of thing because, uh, like I said off air, I I think both clubs really want to challenge each other. Mm. Um, So I'm very interested to see how Flanagan plays for Taylor Mariner this week because I I saw some people saying, oh, no, you can definitely play second row or, or on a fringe or an edge. If that's the case, I I need to say that because um, he's well, he did a he, bit... he did play a bit of like, sorry to interrupt you, Kurt, but he did play. No, you're right. He did play a bit of lock with the Bulldogs last year, so I, I wonder whether he might kind of interchange him with Jack DeBellin and, and want to see what he can get out of him 
as as a middle forward because he he has had a lot of injuries. We know how how laterally you have to move if you're playing on an edge. So I guess there might even be a possibility that we see him play a few minutes in the middle. I, I, that's why I'd be playing him. Yeah, I, I definitely would not be playing him. On an edge, I'd rather be playing. I, look, honestly, I'd, I'd rather play a couchman or, or or someone that has some fresh legs that can do something different. Um, Mariner, early in his year, particularly at the Warriors and, and when he was a kid, junior Kiwi, he could step off his left and his right and, and play early football or play at the line or after the line. But that was a long time ago. So mm. um, you ne- I think you need to play him in the middle um, and batten down the hatches and, and say, look, if I want 30 minutes out of this weekend, just go hard. Just go mad. And, and see what you can do. I, I wouldn't be asking too much more from him this weekend um, to the point where I still think he might start the season in, in Reggie's just to get some some football in him. Mm. But he's going to be important for the Dragons this year. Like, he is, it's, yeah. It's, it's a squad game. So what do you think? Yeah, like I'm, I'm excited about the Raymond Fatella Mariner signing, um, and I'm excited to see what what we see out of him and and, and where they play him. I, I know he's had injury injury concerns, but like I said when we signed him, I, I think if you get 14 or 15 games out of um, Raymond Fatella Mariner, then I think it's a it's a smart signing, experienced player. I think he'll make the players around him better. Um, he's a former club captain, like it's and and those players don't necessarily leave leave clubs. Like that doesn't happen an awful lot. Like Mark Coyne didn't go and sign for the Cronulla Sharks or the Canterbury Bulldogs. So to get a player with leadership qualities as well, I think is a is a massive bonus on top of, of what we uh, what we kind of get of the the the, the ability of the player um, in, of Raymond Fatala Mariner. So yeah, like I think he adds depth to that position, much like Hame Sele upgrades the the front row. I, I think whether he's playing second row, whether he's playing lock, or whether he plays a little bit of front row um, or in that thirteen that that lock kind of middle roller, I think he's going to be he's going to be an upgrade. On, on players we've had there previously. Um, yeah, I, like I'm, I, I'm really looking forward to this game, Kurt, because, yeah, like I think I think your comments are spot on when, when you spoke about the Tigers and you obviously know them better than better than anyone in terms of, of kind of what we're, what we're doing here on the podcast. And, like, I, I think it's another huge battle for the Dragons forward pack and I think that's a, that's a good thing. I think you want to test yourself in preseason. They've come up against a good South pack. They've got the, they've got the ticks in the right column there. But I'm just looking at this Tigers... Uh, roster now looking at the squad that was named by Benji Marshall and you've got yeah like a front row of Otokamanu, Korosau and Klemmer that's arguably one of the better front rows in the competition and then Pabali'i, Kepioa and Alex Seifarth in the back row so I think that's going to be a big battle for for guys like Blake Laurie, guys like Francis Molo who we'll talk about a little bit uh, a little bit later on the podcast when we do our front row position preview um, Alex Twole off the bench even, I know he's not in the front row but even someone like a Fenua Pole and, and, and some of those younger guys that are kind of coming through that Tiger system so it'll be great for both sides but I feel like this might be a nice little litmus test for the Dragons um, because, yeah, that, that Tigers pack, in my opinion, is is kind of shading what we saw out of the, the South pack last week. Obviously, they have they have Cam Murray and Colin Matangi, two of the, the better players at their position, but I think when you look at some of the, the, the body shapes and sizes and frames of some of those Tigers boys, in, in the front row especially, I reckon that's going to be a nice little test for the Dragons, kind of leading them up nicely for round one. Yeah, and, and the thing that I saw last week against the Warriors, and, and I'm only, again, talking about the first 20, 40 minutes, is the way that they played off each other. And it all came through Coruscant. Um There's a couple other boys there too. Uh, Polo, who you mentioned, um, he's a, a, a star in the making. There's a couple of fine new boys that we've signed for sh- shitloads of money from Manly. Um, and and um, going back to reserves, Jake Simkin, um, and um, Jason Matamua is also a, a star as well. There's a lot of guys there, and I I, I don't I can't remember where my notes are now because I'm looking at NRL.com, but the, I think that what the difference is here is uh, John Bateman's yet to come back into the team yeah. as well. Um, I think with the difference between the two clubs right now, and this might steal some thunder from an article I'm going to write in the next couple of days about where the Dragons, Wes, and the Bulldogs are, three clubs desperately trying to find their way again. Um, one of the points is that the West Tigers kids came on last week against the Warriors kids um, and kept playing. Mm. Um, there, there were four guys last week for West Tigers that played in the second half that held on for that win that played SG ball the week before. Yep. Um, so 
I think for the Dragons this this weekend, if they want to win, and it's and, and look again, it's only a trial. And for me, looking at the Dragons, uh, even West Tigers, I just want to see my team go hard when the players that you expect to play first grade. I want to see performance there. Um, so I, I think for the Dragons, I, I, I think you know these two starting sides. I'm a little bit worried about the size, the the shape of the the middles. You got Molo, Laurie, and Debellin, who are basically all the same shape, kind of like short, stocky. Mm. Uh, but West Tigers, uh, uh, maybe this is Benji's style, or he's got a bit from um, Tim Sheens. Or he took Amanu, who's like six five, Clemmer's six four, Papa Lee's short, uh, runs good lines on the on the. Capella was a winger last year, so um, who who should with all you know, intents and purposes, be a second rower. But West Tigers last year wanted to play on the wing. Seafarth is is just a journeyman um, kind of player that, that runs hard. Scored a try last week. Um, but if Dragons don't show up and play, they'll get burnt by this West Tigers team. Now, West Tigers might get the spoon again this year. But if the Dragons want to continue their progress, they need to play like they did last week. And if I think if they do that and step it up another 5%, there's no reason why they can't beat West Tigers this weekend in a trial and Mudgee. Mm. So th- there's no bias here about me saying West Tigers a win. I just think compared to last week, even though it's South versus West Tigers, and West Tigers have won two spoons in a row, this team this weekend for West Tigers is more dangerous than that South team last week. Yeah, I agree. So the Dragons need to be better than they were last week. And if they are... I'm, I'm I'm going to be really excited for the Dragons start the year. Yeah, like I, I guess the last thing that I'll I'll, I'll say about it is um, I, I was critical of the the Dragons depth players and younger players. I thought they were poor against against South um, in, in challenging circumstances, but I thought they were poor on on Saturday night. Um, I didn't think the the Catchman boys were were, were that crash hot. I thought uh, Savili Tamale didn't have a great game. I understand he's not he's not playing, and, and neither is Dylan Egan. But I want to see a response for, from them. Um, uh, yeah, it's probably never a nice feeling when your coach comes out and 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 said, uh, especially if you're one of the younger players, that yeah, you didn't perform necessarily to the ability that that they that they want or that they expected from you. So yeah. I, I just want to see. I want to see a response. Love to see the Catchem boys get some big minutes under them. I'd love to see some some strong carries when some of those more seasoned forwards, like your lorries, like your molos, go go off. Um, yeah, I, I want to see a response from from them, and we get to see some of those fringe guys that more than likely aren't going to start the season in in reserve grade, but are guys that yeah are, are going to be are going to be called upon. Um, and that's that that's the thing. Depth is a very important thing. Might not mean much in 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 the first kind of three or four rounds, but you get to round seventeen and round eighteen, and you're missing a couple of players, um, a couple of forwards, especially with the position the Dragons are in. Those are the kind of guys that need to step up to the plate and and really hit a home run. So I'm I'm really hoping for a, a nice bounce back from from some of those uh, younger guys uh, with the Dragons. But should be a, a Cracker of a game, uh, eight oh five kickoff out there at Mudgee. I know there'll be plenty of Red V fans making the trek out there. The Dragons have got a pretty good relationship with Mudgee uh, since they first uh, started playing games there in two thousand and eighteen, uh, and hopefully uh, next week. Not I know Curtis Woodward won't be hoping this, but hopefully from our point of view, we are talking about a Dragons win uh, next mm-hmm. week. But but hopefully hopefully some positives, even if it's not a victory. Hopefully we can again pull out some positives uh, for that uh, that game against the West Tigers. Time for take one more break here on the Red V podcast, and then we're going to continue to talk. Lots of Dragons footy. We're going to preview our position of the front row and the hookers. And then we're going to have a look at your junior reps results for the weekend and wrap everything up with your fans' corner questions. You're stressed out, can't sleep, and you're in pain. And nothing in your medicine cabinet works. There's a different way. CBD from CB Distillery. CB Distillery's targeted formulations are made from the highest quality clean ingredients. No fluff, no fillers, just pure effective CBD solutions. If you struggle with a health concern, make the change to CB Distillery and get 20% off your entire purchase. Visit cbdistillery.com and use code HEALTH. That's cbdistillery.com, code HEALTH. You're stressed out, can't sleep, and you're in pain, and nothing in your medicine cabinet works. There's a different way. CBD from CB Distillery. CB Distillery's targeted formulations are made from the highest quality clean ingredients. No fluff, no fillers, just pure effective CBD solutions. 
If you struggle with a health concern, make the change to CB Distillery and get 20% off your entire purchase. Visit cbdistillery.com and use code HEALTH. That's cbdistillery.com, code HEALTH. You're stressed out, can't sleep, and you're in pain, and nothing in your medicine cabinet works. There's a different way. CBD from CB Distillery. CB Distillery's targeted formulations are made from the highest quality clean ingredients. No fluff, no fillers, just pure effective CBD solutions. If you struggle with a health concern, make the change to CB Distillery and get 20% off your entire purchase. Visit cbdistillery.com and use code HEALTH. That's cbdistillery.com, code HEALTH. Jack Clifton and Curtis Woodward here from the Red V Podcast uh, bringing you everything about the mighty St. George Illawarra Dragons. Well, much like we've been doing each and every week here on the podcast, we've been pre- uh, pre- previewing uh, the positions at the Dragons. Bit of a mouthful there for Jackie Boy, uh, but uh, previewing uh, the positions of the uh, players in the Red V. And we're up to the front row. We're running out a bit of time, so I've decided to throw Prop and Hooker in together. They're, they're fairly uh, smooth and fluid, so I thought it would make uh, the most sense to you. Yeah, to effectively preview the front row for the Dragons. Um, firstly, I want to focus on on just the prop position, Curtin. And for mine, I still think it's the weakest position at the club. I think the Dragons have done a, a decent job of kind of papering over the cracks when it's come to the back row and, and signing some some positions. And if they were able to sign Lou Chanelay Lua, then, then all of a sudden that second row position is, is looking quite explosive. And we'll obviously talk about that next week here on the podcast. But um, I think, yeah, that, that the middle forward rotation, the props better than it has been last year and in previous years, but uh, I'm still not sold on on bloke, uh, Blake Laurie as kind of the the main man in the engine room for for the Dragons. Um, I liked what I saw out of Francis Molo. Uh, Viliani Fafida has wraps on him. Um, obviously, Hame Sele is going to help that that front row for the Dragons. But uh, yeah, I, I still don't feel sold on on that front row rotation, and still feel it's a it's quite a, a glaring weakness at the club at the moment. What's uh, where do you sit on on the Dragons front row heading into round one? This is this is a really hard thing for me to answer, Jack. And and again, I might be biased as an old bush front rower. Um, <laughs> And yes, I'm not 65, I'm only 37, but I, look, I think y- you are right to a certain degree, but I I almost trust your middle forwards more than I trust your outside backs. I'll start with that. But I do think it, it's not all doom and gloom uh, because I, I was impressed by what the Dragons entering room did in that first half last week when the game counted in that first half. They came up and they hit and they wanted to hit they almost look like they were almost ch- challenging themselves to regenerate, and almost like they they were starting to hunt or were testing each other in a, in a few different passages, yeah. which is promising. And and the line speed was awesome, and it wasn't just one guy coming out of the line saying I'm going to be the big dog. They were actually going up together, and this is very very early, very early to to be talking about this. So I'm only talking about 2024 onward, and I understand your worries. Um, like I said, it's the first embryos of what Shane Flanagan wants from his middle men. Um, and, and I think it will be better again this weekend and it will get better week to week. Uh, I mean, there will be weekends where you come up against, I don't know, the Panthers or whatever, where they just, they're just not good enough, but they have a dick. And that's, I think what Dragons fans want. And and I think he did that last year against the Panthers. Mm. He almost beat them again uh, because the week before, maybe they believed their own hype where they won a game they should not have against the roots of the Cogra. Yeah. I, I, I don't want it to be up and down for the Dragons this year. I, and I'm talking about the middles. Each week, I want the Dragons forwards to say, this is, you know what? I may not be here in three years, but right now I'm one of the leaders of this pack. Yeah. Uh, and I want, I want them to, to, I want them to to want to leave some marks and some bruises and make their opponents sore and sorry and remind these opposition sides what it's like to play against the Dragons because mm. it's been such a long – fuck, sorry, a long time. <laughs> it's been a long – It's right. been you can long, say that. You can say that. It's been a long it. fucking time since forward packs either showed up at Cogra or Wynn Stadium and went – 
oh, you know, we're going to have a tough day today. Mm. So that's where it starts. That's where it all starts. I don't care about, you know, analysis about wingers with post-contact meters and fantasy points and all this other shit. At every rugby league game, I don't care if it's 2024 or 1908 or the year 4,777,000. Mm. That's every year. It doesn't matter. It all starts in the middle. And if you're going to get beaten, don't beat yourselves, but at least bash the other pack. And if, if you get halfway to bashing a good team's pack, then you put their half back and their outside backs and their spot on the back foot to the point where you at least keep yourself in the game. Mm. And that's what the Dragons haven't done for a long time. So, yes, you can have question marks about Blake Laurie and Molo and all these other blokes. But if, if one of them listens to this podcast, I, I dare them to to make them go to their dressing room tomorrow at training and say, listen to this. And Flanagan's already saying this. Be proud that you're playing first grade because there's 150 blokes that you know that came through in the same spots that never made it. This could be your only chance. You're on a contract and one day you might be a labourer or a plumber or in the Centrelink center line. Have a go and be proud of what you're playing for. And I don't think you hear that enough. And no. on top of that, I know it sounds simple. That sound that sounds really dumb and simple. But you're also professionally trained, and you you, you get seven days a week of homework. Mm. So you're you, you're better than just having a go. Inside lines, outside lines, um, uh, decisions under fatigue, offloads in the right positions, pushing up when when someone else has the ball after you've already already had a run. These are the little things. The one percent is the dragons haven't done for ten years. Mm. So, yes, Jack, I understand that there's threats about the players you have in your pack this year, but there's enough players there to get your side on the front foot for enough of a game to get your backs into the game, if that makes sense. I just worry when I – like, and, and that, that's, that's fine. I, I agree with, uh, with a lot of what you're, you're saying, Kurt, but I just look around the league and I see some of the other front rows and not necessarily at, at elite clubs that are going to win the premiership, but even just other sides that are jostling to make the, the top eight. Like the Gold Coast in round one, uh, they've got Fodawaka and then Keenan Pala, uh, Palacia, who's come down from Brisbane. They've also got Big Tino, who plays as, as a lock now, Tino Fasalua Maui. And then you look at Parramatta, Regan Campbell-Gillard, Junior Barlow, and then, yeah, guys like Joe Offie and Gowie coming off the bench. So it's no disrespect to the players that we have, but I just don't, I just don't think they have enough quality to, to compete long-term with some of these other sides that have... And you said it yourself when we were just talking about that preview against the West Tigers. The, you, you've got uh, Molo, Laurie, and DeBellin that all have similar similar frames and aren't really known as being big, aggressive kind of guys. And they can't be against like a, a Tino Fasula Maui who's, what, six foot five, 120 kilos. I, I just think that's when the Dragons are going to come into trouble. I've got no problems with their intent. I've got no problems with the, the passion and believing in themselves. But uh, as much as rugby league's a, f- a physical sport, I, I believe that mm. mentality can only get you so far. And sometimes just the physics of being up against a, a bigger pack. And also when we you, we haven't spoken about it as of yet, but when that forward rotation, so Laurie and Molo and Sele might be able to hold their own for the first 25, 30 minutes. But then when when some of those bench forwards come come on, maybe that's when you you see a change change in the. I think that's what I'm worried about when it comes to to the front row because I've seen this side bullied for far too long. And even though there was some promising signs in the Charity Shield, that was 40 minutes yeah. of a preseason game. So I, I'm I'm just going to yeah leave my comments to, uh, reserved for the for the time being. I, I kind of want to wait oh, and see yeah, what I'll, I see I'll hit this you back team on first. That. I'll hit you back on that. Mm. I'll, I'll quickly say, Murdoch Masilla was great last week. Did he come off the bench on Saturday night or did he start? He came off the bench. Okay, so so he added punch. And and one more question I'll ask without throwing shade at the Titans. What has Tino won at the Titans since he got there? I don't He's know, a great player. He's a great player. They've yeah. won nothing. Yeah. So it's still just the Titans. It's just a jersey and it's just another bloke in a jersey. So uh, that's the NRL for you. And, and obviously I understand the Dragons, and I've said this so many times, that the Dragons, if they stay fit, can push for eighth spot this year. But uh, to be honest, that there will be injuries and and the depth is is a worry. So there will be there will be points maybe at the back end of the year where you go, okay, well, 
It was a promising season, but um, we've picked up some more signings for next year. It, it's a work in progress. It, it really is. So you can't go in any game saying, oh, on paper, the game's won. And I, th- I don't think F- Shane Flanagan is going to let his players do that because as soon as Shane Flanagan sees a player on the field look like they're already beaten before they even have a dig, I think he'll just drop them. Yeah, I understand. I, I don't think you'll do an Anthony Griffin and just keep him in the 17. I think you'll go, you know what, I might as well. It's round 13. You're not playing well. This bloke's done pretty good last week in reserve yeah. grade. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring him up. And I understand there's no alternative. It's, it's just, yeah, that's the opinion that I hold. And I think that's a position that needs to get upgraded ASAP. Definitely, I agree, 100%. Yeah. Um, when we kind of talk about um, the, the front row forwards, there, there are some, some other names to, to kind of speak of. Um, for, for what it's worth, I, I, like, I kind of wrote this down in my notes. I've kind of skipped over it a bit because we've kind of chatted about some other things. But I think Laurie and Molo can be serviceable. Um, not for a moment am I, am I saying that they're, they're guys that they're not going to be able to get over the advantage line. They're not going to be able to dent the defensive line on, on any side. I think just the, doing it for, for week after week is probably the concern I have, but who knows? Flanagan's a great coach, and, and there was a lot of players at Cronulla. I don't think many people had wraps on Sam Tagatizi. People thought Andrew Andrew Hafida was an awful signing from the Tigers. They just thought he was this this forward that was overweight and wasn't disciplined, and he turned out to be one of the best props in the world under Flanagan. So I think he can certainly have an influence and, and help help the side um, achieve what they what they need to. Um, and for what it's worth, I think Laurie and Molo can be serviceable. And you throw Sele in there, maybe Raymond Fatala Mariner plays a bit a prop plays a bit of 13 then you've probably got quite uh, like a half decent um kind of uh, middle forward rotation I, I think the concern is is just making sure those players stay on the field um because yeah i think in every position the dragons have a, a severe lack of depth and front row forward is is no different to that that being said um these are some of the names of some of the other guys around Viliani Fafita's had a great off-season. I thought he was great last year in the New South Wales Cup. Um, I thought he was really good. I'm, I'm still stunned that Manly took Aaron Woods at the back end of his career. Nice guy, great for culture, but not going to add much to your football side and and let go of two of their, their young forwards. I think that was some shrewd business by the Dragons. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, he's he's one that's looking like he's firming to, to be on the bench for, for round one. Uh, Josh Corrick's down the pecking order a bit. Um, yeah, hearing kind of murmurs that he won't be at the Dragons next year. Um, killed it in the New South Wales Cup versus Jersey Fleet trial. Um, but who knows? Often there's been players that have been told they're surplus to requirements and have come back and, and performed really well, got themselves back into first grade. Uh, you've got Alec Tordavaka. He's not playing um, in first grade this week. He'll be in the reserve grade trial against Western Suburbs um, that's happening before uh, the, the first grade match. Uh, Toby Couchman is obviously a big one love to see him on the bench. I think he's someone that can break into the squad uh, throughout the season. And then you've got Michael Molo, uh, Ben Murdoch Masilla, who on the Dragons website and, and through recent years has been has played and been listed as a second row forward. There is no way in the world he should be playing there. He's a middle oh, forward. I, he's Jack, a front, I agree. He's a front I, row I was, forward. That's his position. Yeah. And, and I was going to jump in there, man. I was going to say, I, I think Masilla is your starting prop for the start of the NRL season. Mm. He's got footwork at the line. He's quick enough. He's too slow for the second row. I'm I'm shocked that they kept him in the second row last year. Sorry to jump in again, Jack, but no, I, I think he's a, I think he's a starting prop for you, man. Like he he, he has a bigger body shape, um, and breaks up your forward pack. And he can he's dangerous at the line. And I think he's angry enough that he needs to prove something as well. I I, I he'd be my number eight to start round one. Yeah, well, I'm interested to see how he performs on the on the weekend as well. I think that, yeah, again, we kind of speak about the opportunities for some of these guys to, to break in. So, yeah, there, there's certainly some names there. They're not names that are going to jump, are going to fly off the page at you. Certainly opposition fans are not going to look at that Dragons pack and think, oh, this is a side that's going to completely and utterly roll us. But I, I think, yeah, there's there's probably enough there to to get the Dragons by. And if they were, if the Dragons were able to click an attack, then, then, then who knows? And, and, and Flanagan has a track record. Record of, of having sides that have a miserly defence and, and, and we've kind of saw, seen that from the first 40 minutes of what the boys displayed against against South. Um, very quickly, Kurt, because I, I, I always try and keep the podcast under two hours, but we're getting closer and closer to a week in a week out because we still need to talk at junior reps and, and answer a bunch of fans' corner questions. But in terms of the hooker p- 
position, probably a pretty easy position to preview because there really is only two names there. Like I can't, I can't see Kyle Flanagan playing there um, unless there are some significant injuries and they have to throw him in there. Um, but it is, is effectively Jacob Little and Connor Malazan. Um, we've got a, a, a fans corner question about Jacob Little played really nice and direct and his, his darts at a dummy half, I think uh, will be a big part of what the Dragons do offensively, especially inside the opposition half. I think Little's going to be the starter and Malheisen, um potentially the utility, although maybe a, a, a Jesse Marsh if he continues to perform well in this second preseason fixture, he might kind of have that number 14 jumper. Um, in in terms of, of what Little brings and in terms of the minutes that you would play him, um, I, I I wouldn't be playing him, him 80 minutes. Is, is a little... Uh, uh, 25 minutes, come off, have a break, come on and play another 25 minutes. Is he a 50 to 60 minute straight hooker? Um, do you see times where he maybe comes off the bench to add some um, add some excitement and, and a, a bit of burst of energy off the bench? What do you think Shane Flanagan is thinking for, for Jacob Little? For mine, I guess my humble opinion is I see him as a starter and probably more as a, as a 50 to 55 minute hooker for the Red V this year. Yeah, agree, and I'll be quick. Um, I love Jacob Little, and he's one of the best things that happened to your club the last couple of years. Um, it, it depends on the game. So give him 60 minutes, 55 minutes, but if, if, if the game's there to be won and he's winning the game, don't take him off. Yeah, It's just game situation. If you're winning, he's man of the match, and he's on the way to leading the team. Keep him out there as long as he wants. Um, and if he does need a break, puts his hand up, that's fine. But... Look, just uh, just every game's different, but uh, yeah. Jacob Little is one of your most destructive players, and he works well with Ben Hunt. And if he has a good, intense, flowing middle middle ruck, then if he's playing footy, you don't take him off. Yeah, um, just keep him playing as long as he wants. And if you have to give him a spell at the back end, that's great. But I wouldn't be putting um, numbers on it. Um, I'll, I'll just be seeing how the game's Play, going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because too many times last year, it almost looked like Little was creating something for the Dragons, and then he had to come off. Yeah. And then he was out of the game for so long, and I was getting frustrated. I was throwing stuff at the telly, <laughs> and I'm texting you going, what are they doing with Little? And yeah, so I think this year is just, if the, look, if he's helping you win a game, just keep him out there. Yeah, totally agree. I think yeah, those those two hookers will be the the, the ones that to to work in tandem for the Dragons uh, in season twenty twenty four. We'll do a back row um, a position preview next week. So we'll talk about some of those second rowers. We'll talk about the lock position. Uh, yeah, plenty to discuss next week um, on on the Red V podcast. Before we jump into your fans' corner questions, a quick wrap of our junior reps. Another really good weekend uh, for the Dragons uh, in the junior rep competition. Uh, both. Uh, Harold Matthews Cup and SG Ball for both the Steelers and the Dragons recorded victories for the Harold Matthew Cup sides. That was their first victory of the first victories of the season. So in uh, in Harold Matthews Cup, St George accounted for North Sydney by the tune of twenty eight points to fourteen. So a nice win, uh, nice win there by the by the Dragons. Um, yeah, set it up in the first half with a pretty a pretty good display. And uh, yeah, the the Steelers they uh, they shut out the Central Coast Roosters down there at the Collegian Sporting Complex, winning by twenty points to. Jack Talbot, their fullback, very heavily involved. Um, he played really well as the Steelers co- collected the two competition points there. Meanwhile, in the SG Ball Cup, uh, it was another win for the St. George Dragons. They destroyed Norse across there at the uh, the Hills Grammar School at Kenhurst, winning uh, 60 points to 10, running in 11 tries, and it was a, a destructive performance. We saw another great effort from uh, speeds to Jesse Williams on the wing. He bagged a hat-trick. Uh, Loco Pacific Tonga scored another try, as did um, uh, Jacob Halangahu continuing that trend kids if you want to score some tries on the weekend come on the Red V podcast because we seem to be a, a lucky charm uh, we also saw a couple of tries to Campbell Lyons really from from 1 through 17 they were all fantastic uh, Shadi Hamoud also nailed 8 goals from 11 attempts it was a big win uh, there for the Dragons um, not quite as convincing for the Steelers um, down there at Collegians uh, against uh, the Melbourne Storm 
who put up a good fight and, and led for, for some time. It was the third consecutive game that the Steelers had to come from behind. End up winning by 34 points to 12, but gee, there was a lot of errors in the first half. It was a, a plucky performance, um, but they eventually were able to pull the game out of the fire, mainly thanks to some, some great play from Hayden Buchanan. He was good again, uh, while Tom Kirk uh, finished off nicely. He uh, bagged himself a hat-trick, while Daniel Mifu, uh, Isaac Lawton, and, and Liking King Togia um, all were able to, uh, to get tries, uh, while Cade Reid nailed five goals from six attempts. So that means in the SG ball and uh, in uh, uh, in the um, uh, sorry SG ball for both the Steelers and the Dragons, uh, both the Dragons and Steelers are three from three, are putting themselves in a very good position there. And then very quickly, just the uh, the women's side of the draw, the Lisa Fiola Cup, which is the under 17s competition. Uh, grim reading if you're a St George fan, uh, St George going down to the Roosters by 58 points to nil. Meanwhile, the Steelers continue their good season that, uh, across at Hills Grammar. They thumped the North Sydney Bears by 42 points to 8. And uh, in the uh, the Tasha Gale Cup competition, that's the women's under-19 comp. Again, a dreadful uh, weekend for the Dragons. They were destroyed by the Sydney Roosters Indigenous Com- uh, Academy by 62 points to nil. And uh, the Steelers, big winners against the Bears, winning by 50 points to nil there. Uh, before we jump into your fans' corner questions, let's just have a quick look at uh, the Matthews Cup and SG Ball sides this week heading into round 4. Uh, the Steelers will be, uh, they've got a a, a smorgasbord of rugby league down there at Wynn Stadium, which is great to see them get a chance to play on the hallowed turf of Wynn Stadium. Uh, they uh, start proceedings at 1.30 against the Parramatta Eels. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the St. George Dragons have the bye uh, in the Harold Matthews Cup competition. And then if we uh, jump across to the SG ball, uh, St. George in action up there at St. John's Oval at Newcastle against the Newcastle Knights at 12.50. Uh, meanwhile, the Steelers follow the Harold Matthews Cup side at Wynn Stadium, taking on the Parramatta Eels at 3 o'clock. So a couple of really important games there for the Steelers and Dragons uh, in the SG Ball Cup competition. Of course, we'll have uh, full wrap-ups of that and scores across our social media across the weekend. So make sure you get uh, close to that. Uh, Red V Podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram um, if you're not heading down to uh, support the boys um, at their respective grounds. Let's wrap up the program by taking a look at your fans' corner questions. And Kurt, our first one comes uh, from Declan Stacey via Instagram. And, and fun fact about Declan... Um, great supporter of the podcast, but is actually a, a Commonwealth, a former Commonwealth Games medalist and uh, and and performer. So one of those elite athletes that myself and Kurt, we didn't quite reach those standards. But a huge thanks to, to Declan for sending in his question. He said, "Hey boys, uh, Jesse Marsh, I really liked his energy and speed in the second half of the Charity Shield." Where do you see him, and could he push for a round one spot? I'd be hesitant to put him at six, given he's untested in first grade and hasn't had the time uh, with Hunt to build combinations, unlike Flanagan. I would love to see him get blooded in round one in that 14 jersey, Little to the bench, Flanagan to hooker, and Marsh to 5'8". I think this can add spark and speed around the ruck to capitalize on tired forwards. Marsh seems the top of player that will take this opportunity with both hands. What are your thoughts? Well, you're not going to like that uh, that Declan's put your man, Jacob Little, onto the bench so we can get that out of the way uh, what, what do you what do you make of, of of Declan's thoughts here well Declan I just let you know when I was at Woodland Road Primary School in 1998 that um somehow I threw a discus further than everyone else and went to uh Fisher's Ghost <laughs> the next step so <laughs> athletes in different sports uh like Declan look I, I understand where you what where you're going um but I, I think you you maybe not looking at, at Little the way that I'm looking at him. I, I, I think Little is is almost one of your, your most important players um, mm. because he's sentenced to play and he can pick and choose when he wants to go. And when Ben Hunt finally realises he doesn't have to squeeze you guys to the right and get you guys in trouble and everyone, he and Flanagan, Flanagan played more direct than Hunt the other night. Mm. Um so when that happens, um, I understand what you're saying, Declan. Uh, look, to answer that question, I, I I think we were on the hill the other night, Jack, um, regarding Mushkin. Um, out of the corner of my eye, I said, and I think this might have been the start of the second half, I said, who was that? Because someone just took the ball and just shot um, near the try line and just like mm. way faster than anyone else in the field. And you you and Tim turned around and said, that's Mushkin. I was like, oh, wow. So there's something there. There is something there. That there's a talent there. He's too good for reserve grade, um, but it won't be round one. I, no. I don't think it'll be round. And, and I think Shane Flanagan understands that. That's a development player that will play some first grade this year. Um, but the Dragons, 
if they get their forward pack right, like they did in the first half against South. Mm. If they took advantage of their chances, like I said before, that could have been 18-0, like I said, or, the, you know, at least a couple of tries ahead of South. Uh, could have been a completely different ball game. So I, I think don't look at the overall picture of the game the other night at the Charity Shield. Master is going to be there somewhere, but he's yeah. a backup player. And, and Little is one of the – I hate to say it again, but Little is one of the, the best players the Dragons have in attack this year. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, Jesse Marsh can, is probably one of those players that might come into reckoning later is in the season. Is it Marsh or Marshke? Well, I've heard it's Jesse Marsh. That, that's, so that's, oh, that's well, the... I could be wrong because I haven't watched reserve grade since I stopped commentating. One, so. one of us is right, so that's, the, that, that's, all, <laughs> that's all that matters. Yeah, I think he's one of those players that, yeah, might come into the reckoning later later during the season. When there's injuries, maybe when Ben Hunt's on origin duty. Um, yeah, so I think he's going to play a part in first grade at some stage uh, this year. Next question comes from Shivy111 on Instagram. Are fans overreacting to one trial game? I'll leave it short and sweet for you, Shivy. Yes. Yes, they are. We've spoken about it. There's positives from that game. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think people, uh, not just fans, I think media, everyone else is overreacting. I think, yeah, the Dragons are going to be all right come, uh, come round one. Our next question comes from Cam Boyle on Facebook. And Cam has said, I think the Charity Shield pinpointed our lack of depth at fullback, halves, and hookup. I think at full strength, we'll go all right this season. Just pray for no injuries. Good to see the players looking fitter and more committed. Still massive questions on the fullback position. Thoughts on Sully to the wing and Lomax to centre? Oh. oh I, Cam, I, I still get the sweats thinking about Sully defending at centre. Mm. I I wouldn't push him further out and put a bigger target on his chest. And I think this um this um it's a it's a big trans uh, it's a big transition to move from wing to centre in terms yeah, of it, the that, defensive yeah. the defensive assignments in front of you. So I don't think it's a it's a, n- no. a natural transition for someone like Sully. No, I agree. And and I think sometimes and Cam, I appreciate the question, but uh, to, to defend on the wing in NRL in twenty twenty four compared to centre is as different as playing hooker to 5'8", mm. if, I, if I could explain all that. The, the, so the, the lines, the, the corridors they have to stay in when they're going down the field and then actually support when they've got the ball, but then to defend in teams in their corridors and to be trained one way, which Suley has his whole life, and, and with all due respect to Suley, very unfit at other clubs, to the point where he went to the Bulldogs and got sacked after a couple of weeks because they didn't know what Manly was. It was the other way around. So he went from one club to the Bulldogs and they just sacked him because he was so unfit. It, 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 you need to be, um, and I keep talking about under duress decisions, you need to be just as good in the 75th minute defending at centre as you do defending in the middle. Yeah, and and I don't think Suley's quite there right, even defensively as a centre right now. You put him in the wing, um, you leak an extra twelve points a game, in my opinion. Uh, Sean Canano has written in and said, "Hey boys, I thought the first half showed a lot of grit, fell apart after all the changes. Do you see us operating with a lock in the style of a prop, kind of like Flanner used Gallon at the Sharks? Only style I can see us playing if DeBellin is the starting thirteen. I think we touched on this last couple of weeks. I, I've spoken about this, is that there's a couple of different ways you can play your forward pack. I, I, I'm worried about this Dragon scene this weekend. Um, Molo, Laurie, DeBellin, who are all middle legitimate props, um, all the same body shape uh, against the West Tigers pack, who are playing an ex-winger who can run lines and see far. It, it, I know it's an NRL game, but it's a good question because I I, I can't see I, I can't see the Dragons going into the season with this 8, 10, and 13. I, mm. The way I saw DeBellin rip in in the first 10 minutes of that game the other night, Jack, when I actually still had some com- concentration about me, is I, I saw DeBellin play a lot harder than I've seen him play before. Yep. yep. Where kind of it was almost like when I saw DeBellin – cutting into that line with the ball and playing right, really right in behind the ruck and taking those tough collisions, it was almost like Flanagan had already told him what his job was this year. Mm. So I almost feel like DeBellin might even start the year in eight or ten, depending on how Flanagan wants to play. But DeBellin's definitely not ball playing this year, I, I don't think. 
Yeah. Because that, that's way too slow. And I think you've said it before too. Yeah. It's just for the sake of it, copying James Graham and, and copying yeah. those guys that done it before. DeBellin this year, I think his job is going to be maybe a few shorter minutes, but really get stuck in and just do what you can. Go as hard as you can. Um, he's talking about rep football last year, the year before when he came back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what he's thinking in his head, but look, DeBellin is not a starting 13 the way he played the other night. I think he's going to start at prop. And that means, Jack, a question for you, if DeBellin is a starting prop and actually plays 8 or 10, who do you put at 13 if Flanagan wants to play ball player? Oh, I don't know, because Sele can also play lock, but I think he's probably more suited to the front row. So, well, that's why I wanted Bird there, because I thought Bird was someone that could, could be a bit of a ball player. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. And, and, and I think DeBellin's probably going to play 13 all year. Um, I don't think I, – I don't mind him playing at 13. That's a boring fullback, but – yeah, it is. I don't mind him playing 13, but like I said before, I don't want him playing 80 minutes because that's, that's, you're not getting the full effectiveness out of Jack DeBellin if you're playing him. I think he's a 50-minute he's a 50, a 50, minute, a 50 minute forward these days with, with the age and, and just hasn't quite been the same player since he's, he's come back. But you, you've got to try and find the balance right. I would like to see Hamasele starting. Um, I don't think Hamasele left South to come back to the Dragons to be sitting on the pine for 50 minutes of the game and, and playing mm. 30, 35 minutes. So I think he needs to be somewhere in the front row. Um, I would say DeBellin would be at lock. I, I would like a combination of uh, of maybe – I would prefer Laurie but to that's, be on – Jack, that, that's the worrying part is that – did I hear you say at the start of the podcast, you think Tom Eisenhuth is a start for second row? Yeah, he played great. I, I thought he was superb on Sunday. He's one of the Dragons' best. But- but he's not a ball crashing line running second rower. It doesn't matter if he's if he's, he's committed, a toiler. So how if, many toilers? If he's, how many toilers can you have? If he's good defensively and he and he knows the assignments in front of him and he does his job, then I, I want him there. Okay, but what I'm saying is, is that uh, and going back to what I said before about if DeBellin's going to play a role in the middle third, whether it's eight, ten, or thirteen, where, where's the spark? Where's the like? Sua is. But that's Jayden the thing. Like, there's and there's no, still question marks over him as well. But that's the thing, Kirk, because that and, and that's the problem with the roster, and that's why Flanagan, I, I guess, is attempting to rebuild the the squad, is because there isn't there isn't spark, there isn't quality there. So there's there's some young young forwards coming through. Sele is a decent signing, but it's not it's not pretty, it's not flashy. It's it's Cronulla 2011. It's it's Sam mm. it's it's Sam Tagatizzi, It's Chris Heinington. It's those kind of those kinds of guys. So it's I think the more more important. I would I don't care about them being flashy or bringing spark. I just want them to be to be consistent. And I think the challenge for Flanagan and, and he obviously knows this better than better than we do just as fans uh, is getting that balance right with the Dragons forward pack because he's got he's got a few bodies there now. He's got Eisenhuth, he's got Fatala Mariner that can potentially play on edge. Um you've got Sewer on the other side. You've got DeBellin. Does he play 13? Does he play 8? Sele can play prop but he can also play lock. You've got Laurie, um, you've got Fafita, you've got uh, Francis Molo, Michael Molo is another name there. So, yeah, I- I'm glad I'm not getting paid the big bucks for that because I think mm. you've got to try and find that that balance. Um, and I think where the Dragons have, have fallen down in recent years is great if you've got him in, in super coach or fantasy, Jack DeBellin playing 72, 75, 80 minutes. Um, but I, I don't think he, you necessarily get high quality minutes uh, from him after after the fifty minute mark, um, and you've got to try and get that balance right. And I think that's the I think that's the hardest thing for for the Dragons at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I'm wincing at this conversation, um, not not because of what you said, Jack, because obviously you're making some good points. But it goes back to what I said about um, no teams are scared. Of, no teams have been scared of the Dragons no. for a long time, and that's why I said I think. Uh, Masilla would be great in the front row. And I'm trying to think of ways where the Dragons can be as dangerous as they can to score points and beat teams. I, mm. I don't want the Dragons to go 10-10 this year and lose in the last five minutes. Yeah. I want them – and it's hard because they're, 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 their squad is short. Mm. But I'm just trying to work out with this team, and I'm looking at the team this weekend. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out ways. I, I, I think maybe – Avilami Fafida comes in. I'm thinking Murdoch Masilla can spark something, give him 15 minutes at the start of the game, then bring him into the start of the second half. But it just, the pack looks a bit boring to me. 
I don't think I don't think BMM plays round one. I I I, I don't think he'll be on the bench. Who's that? I don't think Ben Murdoch Masilla plays round one, Kurt. Oh, I thought he went all right the other night. Oh, and, and and so did I, and I'm I'm keen to see him. But I think when you look at it, I think Laurie and, and Molo are going to be the starting props. The back row will probably be uh, will be Sua, Eisenhuth, and and DeBellin, and then you'll have one utility on the bench. So whether that's Connor Mol Eisen or whether it's Jesse Marsh, who's going to be 14, I imagine. But, Phil- but who's running the lines? Who's who's taking the pressure off? The halves on their push to the line that makes it an attacking option where you get an inside line from the second rower. Because then again, it comes back to the old Dragons thing where if the second rowers aren't running lines where they're a legitimate option, the ball just goes out the back again and you get squeezed out over the sideline like you did last year and the year before and the year before. Yeah, but I, like I, I don't think it really, really matters who you start because I just don't think there's a quality there. I think the bench will be a utility. Fafita will be one of the props. Sele will be one of the other ones, and I think Raymond Fatala Mariner probably, uh, probably takes the last, the last, the last bench spot unless they see enough out of him. They want him to start, and maybe Eisenhuth is is on the bench. Okay. I, get, I get it's, I get it's not yeah. pretty. I get it's not flashy, and I get that the same issues that have happened the last couple of years are more than likely going to going to crop up. But that I think that's the position the Dragons are in at the moment, Kurt. And I think that's why they've gone so hard on on, on, on Funiwaki from the Cowboys. I think that's why they've gone so hard on Lukey, why they went hard on Adam Fanua Blake, because they need they need that real presence, whether it's a middle forward, where it's an edge forward. And I think that's where, like, we didn't speak about it much tonight, but that's where the signing of someone like Alei Lua would give them a legitimate, powerful game game-breaking weapon on the edge. Uh, you know what? And your argument also makes sense too, Jack, is that in, in another way, if we're just talking and we're spitball and coaching, is that if that starting team that you want starts hard and goes hard and plays a new Dragons football in the middle, mm. then you can actually bring some punch on from the bench. Yeah. So, oh, the, the, you know, there's, I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I think there's two ways to skin this cat. But but we're 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 talking about the same plays at the same time. So yeah. Um Okay, next question is from James Savage. James said, Thoughts on Flannel Hunt combo. Personally I thought Flanagan was tireless. He will definitely improve as combinations start to click. Marsh was solid as well. I want Sloan to be amazing, but he is so inconsistent. Need to try Lomax. Maybe we'll kind of focus on the, the Flano Hunt question there from from James. I, I, I honestly didn't think that 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 Kyle Flanagan was that bad. I, I know in the second half when he was doing the uh, the the majority of the playmaking duties, he um I thought he played poor in a couple of kicks over the dead ball line. But I thought when 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 Hunt was kind of taking charge and, and Flanagan had a chance to take on the line, I thought it was a couple of incisive runs, and I think he'll be he'll be better for the run. And, and I'm I'm another player that I'm interested to see run around in in Mudgee on Saturday. Yeah, look, Flanagan definitely had his moments where he did square up the line, and that's his job. Um, I think he was a bit better than that, and and give him time. Just yeah, be patient. I mean, like last year, like I, like before in the in the match review, I was talking about how Ben Hunt squeezed himself over the sideline and put pressure on Lomax and, and on that side of the field. But at the same time, before that, Flanagan did his job. He squared up the line and put his prop back in the middle, Blake Laurie, mm. and squared up the field. They could have gone either way. They should have gone back to Flanagan on the left and kept pressuring, but instead Hunt overrid and went to the right again. So Kyle Flanagan is going to be great for the Dragons. Just be patient. Just uh, be patient and we'll get there. I think we found uh, Curtis's burner account. Uh, Paulie Sports on Twitter has said, Hey boys, love the podcast. Massive Dragons fan. Our attack seemed clunky and sideways inside the opposition 20 metre. I feel like we are most dangerous through little at dummy half on quick play the balls. Do you think we should attack more around him to straighten it up? So Kurt, when did you when did you send that oh, tweet, mate? Get when- lost. <laughs> maybe people are just starting to listen a little bit. That, maybe they are. I think he makes nah, I, I think Paulie makes a really uh, an, uh, like in all seriousness makes a very good point. I think the Dragons, even last year, have looked their most dangerous when they've been direct and running through the middle through little. If you look at NRL trends over the last couple of years, no team wants to attack inside the 20. It completely clunks up their game. All teams want to attack from their own 50 or behind their own 50 and create momentum and run through the middle and, and create tries through the middle. No team wants to get a penalty five, ten metres out from the goalpost. Mm. You watch the whole game. No one wants to do it. 
No, everyone's in the same boat. So whatever hashtag King Curtis is the best. That's great. Good <laughs> on you, mate. Um, no, but but it's true though. Honestly, it, it, all teams want to attack from their own half or from halfway because that's the momentum they have. Um, if you watch all in all games, is that once you get inside the twenty, it is so hard to score because they, the defensive line keeps coming up, penalties, six against, blah blah blah, whatever it is. It's just too hard. It's not all yeah. the old days where you just keep pressing the line and someone gives up, mm. you actually get more time on your line to, to reset. So the Dragons are just starting to learn. We don't want the ball inside the attacking 20. We want to actually start playing like the other teams and be like the other teams, and they're starting to actually uh, put players in place that go, okay, well, why why should we get down there on the field on penalties or six agains or whatever? The, you look at the Dragons. I'm not going to ask you to do this, Jack, but yep. if you look at the Dragons inside uh, attacking 20 in the last couple of years, probably the worst strike rate of any team. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say probably, yeah, probably one of the worst yeah, strike probably rates. Probably right, yeah. Because they're already in trouble from their own 40. And you saw it the other night on the Charity Shield. Ben Hunt was still overriding calls and getting squeezed on right-hand sides from 40 metres out. So what chance have they got on the try line? So teams are actually inviting the Dragons. The good teams actually invite bad teams down to their try line because they can basically just sit there for 10 minutes and defend them and squeeze out a penalty goal and go, well, that's 10 minutes of the game gone and we've given up two points. Mm. So once the Dragons realize that and they can attack from their own half, attack from 50, 40, 30, go down the field, they're going to start scoring some really good tries. And I think if you watch that again, the Charity Shield, the opportunities they created, slowed in backfield, little down the middle, was all outside the 20. Yeah, that's once right. They, yeah. Once they got on the try line, they were fucked. Mm. So it's a good question, but I don't know the bloke. <laughs> I, pro- I promise. <laughs> well, that does bring us to the end of our Fans Corner segment for another week. Thanks so much, folks, for sending your questions in. They get better and better each week. And, yeah, re- we, we, we do really enjoy the the um, the, the versatility of, of, of fans and, and questions. And we get questions about, yeah, where kind of, yeah, drags curd into analysis mode and, and us talking about, yeah, the makeup of the Dragon side and the way they're attacking, but even even just other questions about, yeah, what the, what the side is going to look like and, and about particular players strengths and weaknesses. We do uh, really appreciate all the questions uh, that you do send in. As always, uh, you can flick them through to us, redvpodcast at gmail.com. It's been a long night, but we're almost done. Uh, time to wrap things up by taking a look at the uh, the Who Am I question that we uh, asked a little bit earlier on in the evening. Uh, this particular player played 144 first grade games, uh, including uh, 45 of those for Illawarra, which led to 11 tries. 48 tries and 28 goals in his career. He also spent time at Manly and the Northern Eagles. And Kurt gave us a little bit of insight into what he's doing over in his neck of the woods, uh, doing some coaching uh, over there in that that, comp- that rugby league uh, competition. Um, had to retire due to some back and, and knee injuries. Uh, Kurt, do you want us to, what, what, could you please reveal to us who you think the Who Am I is this week on the Red V podcast? I was going to say, I haven't said Sir Herman Barton for a while, but uh, I believe it's <laughs> Bre- uh, Brendan Reeves. Yes, Brendan Reeves is, in fact, uh, the Who Am I uh, here uh, tonight on the Red V Podcast. Yeah, 45 appearances for the Steelers, which qualifies him as uh, as uh, someone to talk about here on the Red V Podcast. And, uh, yeah, I uh, hope he has a very successful year coaching, Brendan. Obviously, uh, a pretty handy fullback back in the day, and uh, anyone that can play 144 times in first grade um, has my tick of approval here on the Red V Red V podcast. I hope Brendan's doing well wherever he is these days. And uh, yeah, thanks to all of you for playing and uh, a wonderful job done by Curtis Woodward to finally get one of the Who Am I's this week. We didn't stump him. Uh, so I'll have to try a little bit harder next week. Kurt, it's been a long show, but it's been a very enjoyable one, mate, talking a, a lot about uh, uh, what's been happening at the Dragons and a lot of analysis. It's been a lot of fun from my end, mate. Hope it's been as enjoyable uh, for you. And uh, yeah, we'll do it at the same time next week, mate. These are getting longer, Jack. What's going on? <laughs> 
Too much, too much, too much football. Too much. Uh, too, thank you, Jack. Too, Appreciate too, it, mate. Too Thanks, much buddy. Football. Always great to have Kurt Wood on the podcast, doing a marvelous job as always. Thanks to all of you, the fans. We really appreciate you tuning in each and every week, and we're seeing more and more people engage with us um, on social media, listening to podcasts. We're close to the season, and we love to see that. So yeah, really appreciate your support to uh, the Red V podcast. Big game for the Dragons against the Tigers on Saturday night. We'll be speaking all about that next week on episode 215 of the Red V podcast, and hopefully talking about a Dragons victory. But until then, on behalf of Curtis Woodward, I've been Jack Clifton. Let's go those mighty Dragons. Sports Social Podcast Network. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing... The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of the Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play the Godfather now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply.